All right, we are back from lunch. Madam Clerk, item number 20 on our agenda. Item 20 is from the Office of Emergency Services to receive a presentation on fuel break projects throughout Calaveras County. Good afternoon, board. Michelle Patterson, Calaveras County Office of Emergency Services. It's my pleasure today to um, introduce the Calaveras Amador Forestry team who will be giving you a presentation on the work that's being done around the county. They have an amazing presentation and some good information to share with you. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Battalion Chief Cameron Todd, and he will take over the presentation. On, uh, microphone's on. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, hold it down. Push that. Oh. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, as she said, I'm uh, Cameron Todd. I am a battalion chief with Cal Fire. Uh, my specific job is the tree mortality coordinator um, for the Calaveras Division, which basically means that over the last uh, year, I have been helping to coordinate uh, fuels projects for the department, as well as work with the uh, cooperators in the fuels reduction efforts that uh, have been undertaken throughout the county. And I'm uh, Pat McGreevy, I'm from Glencoe, District 2, and I'm representing the um, uh, Calaveras Amador uh, uh, forestry team. And uh, we're a small a group of uh, retired folks most of which are, re uh, are uh, registered professional uh, foresters. And then there's a, a few uh, other uh, professionals, uh, which I'm one. Um, I have uh, two fellow members here, Jan Bray is a forester, and Pete Pedalford somewhere, there he is. Uh, go ahead. Okay, um, so there's some handouts that I put before you that I would like to explain before we go into the slide presentation. Uh, the first one that you see is the Tuolumne Calaveras Unit Tree Mortality Fuels Reduction Update. Um, this is just to give you information with regards to what Cal Fire is doing in the two counties that our unit covers, in Calaveras and Tuolumne. <coughs> and the totals on the front page are down there near the bottom. Yes, and for anybody interested, I did I put handouts over there. I'm sorry there's so many of them. I had to put some of it on the floor. <laughs> So I presented you with that just so you have an understanding of what uh, Cal Fire is doing within the two counties, in Calaveras in particular. Um, we are actively involved in a large number of projects, and I would say that we are operating at or near capacity through the winter months, and then we roll right back into fire season. And as you know, we started in, uh, we were still fighting fire in January, so uh, it's been a condensed uh, winter for us on those projects. Um, we are, uh, Expanding our abilities in the fuels reduction area in that uh, we now have two masticators, Cal Fire masticators, one working in Tuolumne County and one is down in the Rancho Calaveras area. So I, I just give you that information so you have an idea what Cal Fire is doing. Um, the next one behind that, this is uh, report 242, Fire on the Mountain, Rethinking Forest Management in the Sierra Nevada. This is a report that came from the Little Hoover Commission, and um, this entity exists. It started in the 1960s, and it comes up with um, information for the governor's office, if you will, on uh, items of concern in the county, or uh, in the county, in the state of California, and recommendations on how to uh, tackle different issues, if you will. And this is just the summary report that I provided for you, and I'm only going to spend a quick moment on this because we have a lot to cover. If you go to page. It says page seven down at the bottom. There's a series of nine recommendations that came out of this report. And this, uh, generally speaking, is, is talking about what we're up against out here in our forests and ways that they recommend we tackle those. And this first recommendation says, led by CAL FIRE, the state of California must engage in collaborative landscape level forest management for the long-term forest resiliency. And I'll stop right there because I think that's key to where, where we are and what we're talking about today. So it does talk about collaborative efforts throughout our state to deal with our forest issues. The other one is uh, item number eight, 
which is on the page nine at the bottom. There is a recommendation from this body that the tree mortality task force should evolve into forest management planning entity with dedicated funding. It should help set a strategic direction for forest management, identify measurable goals, decide how to track results and recommend course corrections to better achieve those goals. So obviously there was some work done on this and since it's at the Sacramento level, I thought that this body would be interested in hearing about that. Uh, the next one is uh, communities at risk and this has to deal with historic fires and um, fire behavior analysis and fuels and terrain and topography and so on. And if you look at this community at risk list, you'll find just about all of the communities in Calaveras are listed there. Not all of them, but most of them are there. Is there any, is, is there any rank to this? No, it's, it, it has to do with that fire hazard severity zones, if, if you're familiar with what that is. And these are the communities that fall into those. Pretty much everybody. Uh, the following one after that, this is from uh, my partner here to the right. And it's just issues that they've identified that need to be uh, at least looked at, addressed. Um, behind that is an article out of the Sacramento Bee that addresses the fuels issues in the forests. So we handed that to you as well. And then the last one is the slideshow that we'll be presenting to you today. Easier to slide the cover off of that instead of the slideshow. I think it's that, but I can't. No, it says to go to open. So um, we, were, we did a uh, cooperators meeting of uh, entities um, that are involved with fuels management in our county and uh, this Cal Andrew also works in Amador County. On a regular basis, we meet to discuss fuels projects, both conceptual, uh, ongoing, and completed. And at the last presentation, this Cal Andrew came up with a, an outstanding presentation that for the first time in one location put all of the fuels projects going on in our county. And so out of that, we were asked to come before you and give you a presentation on, on what we had done there. So we've tailored it a little bit to this, to this body, and that's what we're going to show you now. Okay, so this is uh, the collaborator group that I just uh, talked to you about. These are the people that come together on a regular basis and discuss our fuels management issues in our county. I'm sorry, I'm gonna be talking fast because we thought we had 20 minutes and so we practiced this at a, a pretty high speed. So slow me down if I'm talking too fast. This next slide is a picture from 1926 and it's showing old growth ponderosa pine as it says there. Um, the interesting things here with regards to a healthy forest is that you can see through these trees. You can see there's a grass layer underneath and we have trees and we don't have much of a brush component in there. This is an example of a healthy forest back in the 1920s. Now you move forward to modern day and on the left, you're looking at uh, Sandy Gulch on CCWD property. And the difference here is you can't see through those trees anymore. Heavy vegetation uh, in what we call ladder fuels, fuels that are available in fire to take that fire from the surface up into the tree canopy is now choking off the vegetation in our forests. This is an example of how our fires grow to such extreme conditions. On the right, you see another example here. This is the Lily Gap BLM project. And you can see they've cleaned out that vegetation and taken it back to the slide that we showed you before, back in the 1920s. This is where we would certainly like to see all of our forests go to. It's a Herculean task. Um, we have to think strategically. We have something that has occurred over the last 100 years and we have to start working towards moving that back. But we're going to have to think strategically because there's so much work to be done out there and limited resources to do it. So the goal of this presentation and the group is to reduce the risk of wildfires devastating local communities and forests in Amador and Calaveras counties through interagency collaboration. This slide um, was pulled with statistics that date back in five year increments to the 1950s. So in 1951 through 55, you can see in our county just under 20,000 acres burned. And then in the next uh, five year segment, you see 56 to 60, we also had large fire growth. And then it starts to go down again, and it goes up and it goes down depending upon different conditions. The interesting thing here is when you get into the 1980s, you start to see that our large fires start to grow larger, a slow year and then larger. 
slow five years, a slow five years and larger still, and we know that this right here was when the Butte fire was. So there can be all kinds of different things associated with the cause of that, but the one thing that we can't deny is that our fuel loading out in those forests is getting heavier and heavier, and that causes greater and greater fire intensity. Okay, this uh, next series of slides are some historic fires that we uh, pulled up. It is by no means all of the fires we face in our county, but it's an example of what we're up against. This uh, dates in the 1980s, 1988, the railroad fire burned up near the community of Railroad Flats and threatened all of the communities and uh, homes and uh, trees in that area. And you can see it was at 6,690 acres located up in the Railroad Flat area. This next one, is the old Gulch fire. This is in the early 1990s, so we've moved a decade forward and now we're at 17,419 acres. Move into the 2000 and we have the Darby fire. This one ran up through the, the uh, Stanislaus drainage and burned along our county line, threatening the Highway 4 corridor and all of the residences associated with that area. Then we have the Butte fire which came from Amador County into our county with a wind pushed, pushed down through uh, our county into this area of Frico City Sheep Ranch, threatening all of the communities around the perimeter of this. Large majority of our uh, mid elevation county burned or threatened by that fire. This next slide is a very interesting one. When you put all of those together, you basically show a stretch of fire threat that goes from Amador County all the way across to Tuolumne County at the mid elevation. This is basically the transition from the brush fuel models into the timber fuel models. And what we were trying to demonstrate and show to you with this is our threat is basically all the way across our county. It's not isolated to one particular area. This is off the uh, CAL FIRE uh, website, the FRAP map, and basically everything that you see here in red is high, sever high hazard severity zone danger for fire. And if you go back to the previous slide, it lays right in on top of that. So we have a real problem on our hands out there. This uh, slide, once again, is the county. We put the fires on top that we just showed you. And again, that is by no means all of the large fires. It's just a sampling. And you can see the Highway 26 corridor, the 49 corridor, the Highway 4 corridor, all threatened by these. And what you're seeing up here, color coding wise, is what we have either completed, we are working on, or they are conceptual projects for fuels reduction around our county. And I do not mean the Cal Fire patch. This is everybody involved with uh, fuels reduction work out there. That's what this compilation is. So as we go through these remaining slides, if you see something in red, it has been built, built and it is defensible, whether it's a fuel break or it is um, some sort of a VMP project or fuels reduction uh, project by SPI, for instance. If it's in green, it's under development. We're working on it. And if it's in purple, it's conceptual. We recognize that there's a need for it, but for one reason or another, we haven't got there yet. Okay. This slide shows the McCollum Hill fuel break. We put this in around uh, 2010 to 2013. This is the community of uh, McCollum Hill. The uh, McCollum River drainage is right down here below. And this is the fuel break that goes along the edge of the canyon wall behind the community. The reason that this is in the slideshow is this was a successful fuel break. This actually held the Butte fire in check and we did not lose any structures in McCollum Hill proper during that fire. The crews and the personnel were able to come in and utilize this to do a backfire operation off of this fuel break project, hold that fire in check that was coming out of the canyon, and protect all of the residents and everything within the boundaries of that. <coughs> so what we're going to do at this point is we're going to take a trip around the county uh, east of Highway 49. We are not focused on the western portion of the county below Highway 49. We're staying on this side of the county just because this is where we just showed the most danger and there's a lot of projects going up on that in that country. I don't want to de-emphasize uh, the hazards and the fire associated with west of 49, but for, for the demonstration purposes and what we're talking about today, we're staying east of Highway 49. 
This is McCollum Hill right here. That's the fuel break that we were talking about. This is Highway uh, 26 going up, on up into Rich Gulch and on up into the Glencoe area up here. What you'll notice is on our map, we do not have any conceptual, completed, or ongoing projects on this portion. We recognize that the fire, uh, Butte fire, came across right here and, and punched right into our county across Boston Yale. We are working on this right now. I have discussed this with the field battalion chief and we do have a conceptual uh, map of fuel break projects running from our McCollum Hill project on up to Glencoe and then across Ridge Road connecting over to the Railroad Flats area. And we'll show you what's going on in Railroad Flats in an upcoming. So uh, again, this is a recognition that we need work along here. We do have the opportunity and we are working on it. So that one is that one takes us from McCallamy Hill on up through there to Glencoe. And Pat will take over on what's going on up in Glencoe. In 2010 in Glencoe, we actually started to, uh, to put together a fire protection plan. And, uh, and, we, and uh, working on a shoestring, like donations of, of labor, et cetera, we were able to put in about 50 acres of, of fuel break. And at the same time, we put in, uh, you know, conceptualized other fuel, other fuel breaks that we needed. And so in, in purple right here, you can see uh, the, the, a conceptual fuel break and that I actually submitted a grant proposal in uh, 2015 and it was <clears throat> not awarded and it was refused about two months before the Butte fire. So uh, uh, a little late. Um, but anyway, uh, we're coming back at this we're in develop and we're gonna try again to put these fuel breaks in. Who's got control? Next slide. So going from Glencoe, we're going to move from Glencoe down here uh, through a go, kind of going up 26 through Sandy Gulch. And some of you know the CCWD land, right, which is here in blue. And then we're going to move over to a place called Bummerville. And then we're going to go up to Lily Gap. And we're going to move on across the North Fork of the McCallamy River at Tiger Creek Reservoir into Amador County. An interesting part of all this is that th this is all... Uh, BLM land, BLM land here, BLM land here, and BLM land here. So working with BLM, uh, BLM land is a uh, is a uh, is easy because we have one uh, landowner. So in here in uh, 20, uh, 1816, in 2016, this uh, this area right here, we put in for a. Uh, 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 Sierra Nevada Conservancy planning grant and we, we were awarded $74,000 and that uh, and with that money we delivered a CEQA, a joint CEQA NEPA and uh, that that need, uh, that is uh, being completed right now and the grant will be closed in uh, this week maybe. <clears throat> so earlier last year or late last year I put in for a, a second grant and it was for $500,000 and it's to treat, uh, this is the Railroad Flat Cemetery, and it's to treat this area in, uh, in here. That will be awarded at the June meeting of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. That brings us to phase three, and I'm working on this grant proposal right now, and it will expand, it will finish off all the, the treatments we need here, and extend westward to Deerdorf Road across private property and head towards Glencoe. The value of this grant application that I'm putting in is $1.7 million. <clears throat> Next, in Bummerville, that's BLM land, and archaeology studies are being completed right now. And uh, we'll be putting in, in June, another grant proposal for, uh, for the wildlife and botany studies, which will, bring us, which will complete NEPA CEQA there. And with luck, we'll get implementation of money later and have this uh, fuels reduction going on maybe next year. Now we go up to Lily Gap up here and the, the once this place in red has been treated in, in 2010. It's now eight years old and when you go up there and look at it, it looks like a park. Um, and so we're good there. We're good, we're good there and you get into this green area right here and that's BLM and that's being treated right now. I was out there yesterday and I could actually see all the loggers out there working and, and shipping the manzanita. This was a big total manzanita patch and now it's like two or three inches of chips laying on the ground with pine trees coming up. 
Yesterday also, I was out on this little stretch here, Lily Gap fire break, and that's being burned today, uh, prescribed burned. And uh, we actually have a tour that we're bringing people up there to see the burning uh, tomorrow. And that leaves us with the last uh, little uh, purple patch here, which takes us from Lily Gap down a steep hill on into the Tiger Creek Reservoir, heading towards Amador County. And that's conceptual and uh, Jan Bray, the forester here, and, and myself and others are, are working to get permission from the private landowner, one of the private landowners to go across there. Next, next, I think we're in the next slide. No, it's gonna take over. Go ahead. So uh, I have to relay to you why some of these projects exist where they are. We, we try to think strategically and where we are going to be able to hold large fires. It doesn't make any sense to put a fuel break in at a location where the firefighters are not gonna come and try and hold a large fire. So many of these things, these projects that you're seeing are on the ribbons of the canyons where our fires traditionally burn through, or they're at choke points in these canyons where we're gonna try and hold it from continuing to burn up the canyons. It was a big problem during the Darby fire to find a place to cut these fires off. So keep that in mind as we go along here. Um, what they've done right here with this project coming across the uh, south fork of the McCallamy River is they've given us a choke point, if you will, a place to hold a fire that's burning up through that canyon. So this is a very well strategically located project. And then down here is Ridge Road, where we're gonna be trying to hold any fires that would be coming up out of the drainages and canyons down below there. And I already mentioned 26. So this next slide, we're gonna zoom into this up here because there's a lot of good collaborative efforts going on up in this area. So we've zoomed in on Tiger Creek Reservoir right there. This is the area that's BLM land that would take us off the canyon wall down into the bottom of this. Amador has a whole series of planned and existing projects on their side of the uh, North Fork of the McCallamy to help us with this choke point, if you will, and then to hold, hold the fire within the canyon. We're doing the same thing on our side, all uh, on the uh, BLM lands, on the private lands through SPI, and through what Cal-Am and the others are doing with regards to working with BLM and the other entities that are out there. Forest Service as well has other projects farther up the drainage, but we're not gonna go much farther than that. We're gonna start coming across on the next slide uh, through Railroad Flats and down Highway 4. This is, this map comes to us is uh, from CAL FIRE, and it's the last tactical map, the tactical map on the last day of the Butte fire. So what it, what it shows, all these X's here are, <clears throat> are dozer lines. And uh, so there's, they've been sitting out there since 2015. And right now, you know, they're starting to grow manzanita and, 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 and we're not maintaining them is, is the issue. So we have to make a decision on which one of, one of these dozer lines have strategic value in fighting fire and then to go ahead and invest uh, some money into uh, 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 maintaining them. I'd like to draw your attention to this one here, just south of Railroad Flat, uh, in that little, uh, this is called Calaveras Reservoir there, and Railroad Flat Road being here, and this goes all, all the way up to Summit Level Road, down Summit Level Road, then it turns south and comes down east, <coughs> east of Arnold, and it ends up at H H Hathaway Pines. The length of that dozer line is 22 miles. So we are now are starting to work on this segment, which is called the Pine, uh, Pine Ridge segment, six miles, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and let's go on to the next slide. It'll show up there. But before we leave that, one thing to show you, again, going into the fire suppression aspect of this, is you can see all of the canyon drainages are going right up in that direction. And if you see what's being created here, it's basically a catcher's mitt at the top end of all of those drainages. These are the locations that we look for to hold fires if we have to pull back into what we call an indirect attack. Next slide. So now we're gonna, here's that pine, here's uh, Calaveras Reservoir. We're going up these ridges. We end up at, at, uh, at summit level. We are uh, crossing, uh, uh, it's 150 feet wide, six miles long, crossing six private owners. And the status of this right now is Jan Bray, who's right here, and myself, Julia Co and Julia Costello, from uh, archaeologists from um, McCallamy Hill. We're we're putting together the NEPA CEQA documents right now, which we need to proceed with. And 
And so we could be into implementation by, with, by CAL FIRE within months. Um, so we get up to, uh, that takes us up to the top to summit level. And I think we go to the next one, don't we? Here we pick it up again at summit level. We go up and here's where it com comes down. This is, uh, it comes down to White Pines and Arnold. So we're now in a district five. And, uh, and this is all for service land. And the fuel break uh, down in this area, I think it's three, 400 feet wide. And uh, uh, it's being scheduled to burn uh, for a prescribed burn within, I think, weeks. Uh, uh, so that, that really is, is protecting uh, the western side of, uh, of Arnold. We call that the, in the WUI. WUI meaning W-U-I, Wildland wild uh, Urban Interface, the WUI. We're gonna jump from this point down here uh, uh, near Avery and we're gonna go up to Dorrington and then come back down to, to come back down to Murphy's. Next slide, please. So here's Dorrington up here. Here's Highway 4 going down. And uh, in, in, the Dorrington, in the Dorrington area, there are no fuel bricks. So <clears throat> we have been uh, this uh, collaborative group, which by the way are commonly called the burners because they're out lighting matches all the time. They, um, <clears throat> this group in, uh, has sat down with SPI, the yellow is SPI, and SPI is, is programming a fuel break on, on the uh, canyon, the Stanislaus Canyon side of Dorrington to protect Dorrington. And, and down in here is also, will be a SPI uh, project. Coming south to Dorrington, we come into this whole big area here, and that's the um, uh, Calaveras uh, Big Tree State Park. And they have an aggressive program to reduce all understory and, uh, fuels and ladder fuels. And the project is being conceived and directed by uh, Heather, uh, <laughs> Heather Reith right there. Heather uh, is a special person because she's homegrown. <laughs> and uh, she's worked her way up in, in uh, the, the Highway 4 community to this high position uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, mm -hmm. our community and, and running this project over in the forest, in the uh, park. Coming down from the park, we enter into Blue Lake Springs, which some of you know very well. And, uh, and uh, on this side of, of Blue Lake Springs, we have once again BLM, uh, uh, sorry, SPI in yellow stepping up. And these big uh, red polygons are fuel brakes, which are in functional, they're shaded fuel brakes. And they're a product of the, of the beetle kill. So as you know, B Blue Lake Springs was hit really hard. And, and so uh, SPI went in and took out all their, all, all their beetle trees. And it's a shaded fuel brake, kind of looks like a park there. And, and SPI's promised to come around uh, uh, down here. It's, they programmed it in to come around the south side of Blue Lake Springs. And we're also talking about a, a, a conceptual field break to connect SPI over to this blue, which is CCWD property, which, which needs a haircut. Um, so do you want to say a word about Blue Lake Springs? Currently, we're in there right now getting landowner agreements with the areas around the perimeter that we have recognized are gaps between, say, SPI, the park, and the Forest Service projects. So we have, uh, we have uh, set aside funds for that. We're out there getting the signatures from the homeowners as we speak. And uh, our plan is this spring to go in there and start doing additional work around Blue Lake Springs. So just the last comment on the slide. So you see the river drainage running along here, and basically, what you see is the Highway 4 corridor, and you will start to see a uh, line of projects that, if not uh, continuous, is pretty darn close. And the efforts are a collaborative effort to protect that Highway 4 corridor from uh, fires coming up out of the river drainage on this side of the highway. So these, uh, go back. So the, this, these projects here, this is McKay's project, and then uh, down here and, and these polygons, those are uh, 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 less chance field break. And this, this area in here is all uh, United States Forest Service property. 
So once again, we see this collaborative that, that comes together with uh, CAL FIRE, uh, SPI, um, uh, United States Forest Service, and, and others. Mm -hmm. Ready? Next you got last slide. chance? Yeah. Did you lay out last chance? There? Last chance comes down right here, and it's push we're pushing against Forest Meadows right now. So on this slide, you come down from um, Avery, and now we're down in the Forest Meadows area. What we're currently doing right now is we're working what we call phase one below Forest Meadows. This is a fuel break project that uh, was started uh, back around 2006. They completed all of the uh, environmental studies but never got to the actual work on the ground. But we obtained funding, and this is a uh, internal CAL FIRE operation right here. Below all of these homes on phase one, we have crews out there as we speak, and they are creating a fuel break. Phase two will take us over to the Forest Service property, taking us around Darby Knob and up into this location to again continue that Highway 4 protection. And we take that line on down below Forest Meadows. There is a prominent ridge line that hooks around right over here to the Utica Powerhouse, just above Murphy's. And now we've taken a complete line from basically Dorrington on down into that location. So there is, a, there is an effort out there to uh, protect that entire Highway 4 corridor from fires on this side. Did you want to go to the opposite side or is that the next slide? Yeah, for, uh, I thought you were going into Murphy's. Okay, we'll finish up here at Murphy's. So coming down this, this side, Pat was, was talking about the Forest Service fuel breaks that were going into Avery. We also have a dozer line, the uh, remnants from uh, Butte Fire that are still here. So we want to keep that intact. And then we have a project just above Murphy's right here. This is another fuel break project that's going across a lot of property boundaries. And I just want to emphasize to this group, Getting a lot of homeowners to sign up to have this work done is, is not an easy task. But we're taking this on because strategically, this ridge line right here is a line of defense for the community of Murphy's from any of the old gulch or butte fires that start making runs up through these drainages. So that brings us down a, a, a continuous line on this side of the Highway 4, if you will, across Murphy's and gives us a line of defense strategically for large fires. Next slide. So that's our plan as of today. You notice there's a lot of gaps. You notice we didn't talk about Vallecito and, and we didn't talk about Douglas Flat. We did talk about the big gap on Highway 26 where Butte Fire came, came over and got us. And so our plan, we, let's just guess, it's half done. So half done, who's gonna pay for, how, how much is this gonna cost? Well, we have two, we, we, divide our fuel breaks into large landscape uh, fuel breaks. And uh, so these would be entire parcels, entire watersheds. And we have about 10,000 acres of, of landscape kind of fuel breaks. Down here are our traditional fuel break lines. And we have 1,000 acres down in, uh, in that category. And if you just choose an, uh, a figure we often use is $3,000 per acre to take the, the fire fuel off of it. And so when you add up all your acreage, we have 11,000 acres that we need to treat now in our plan, and that's gonna uh, cost $21 million. <clears throat> so now let's assume we have that in, we have to maintain it, and we figure we need about $1.7 million a year to maintain all this effort that, that we've put in. So I just got through saying we're only half done for the whole county. So really what we need is uh, $42 million. And, uh, and for maintenance, we need uh, two th uh, $3 million, something like that, per year in the, in the out years. This would protect us from catastrophic fire. I don't remember what the cost of the Butte fire ultimately was. But, <clears throat> but in comparison to our $20 million here, it's probably not very much. You know those figures better than I. Next slide. So how are we gonna, so where's this money gonna come from? In the past uh, a couple years, up until uh, 2017, we were, the state uh, was generating, was allocating about, about uh, uh, one million, uh, no, 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 let's, $17 million a year uh, for the whole Sierra, Sierra Nevadas. Okay, now this year, all of a sudden, we have $200 million for fuels reduction and forest restoration in the Sierra Nevada. 
if the bond, uh, water bond pa <coughs> passes in June and a second bond in November, that's gonna bump that figure up to $300 million available for us to restore our force and make us fire safe. Well, that's good news. So the next question is, what's our capacity to secure that money and to invest it wisely in our lands? Right now, um, we are, uh, we lack grant writers. So in Calaveras County, in the, in the rounds that are going on right now, there's two grant writers. There's myself and Gordon Long. <clears throat> um, so we can only write so many grants. So we need grant writers. Now let's assume that we're really, uh, uh, really good at writing grants and we start bringing in 10 million, 20 million, 30 million dollars a year to Calaveras County. Who's gonna manage this money? Right now, I am spending all my time managing uh, tree mortality uh, issues with individual owners in Blue Lake Springs rather than writing for the next grant. So we need to beef up our administrative uh, capacity to bring this money in and, and do all the accounting on it and write the reports and all that stuff. And then finally we end up with, we got all, let's say we got all of that solved where are the foresters? Where are the loggers? Do we have enough, uh, enough uh, experts on the ground to actually go out and to do the work? So if, when you look at this slide, this is just a conceptual slide. Here's, here in the bottom is a CAL FIRE capability. They have inmate crews. We don't expect that, that they're gonna be able to do any more work in the future as, as they have in the past with their inmate crews. In the meantime, Here's, here's where we've been uh, working with uh, grant funding, and it's shooting up dramatically. Here's our ability to, to write to grants now and bring in money, and here's our ability for the foresters and loggers to put that money to work on the ground. So this, this slide demonstrates quite clearly uh, what, our, what our capacity uh, is at the present time. Next slide. So that brings us to the conclusions. God knows we need to increase pace and scale. And, uh, and state is, uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention, what's the motivation of state? So state has been, CARB has been putting all their money into tailpipe emissions, reduce tailpipe emissions. But a whole year of reducing tailpipe emissions are wiped out with one catastrophic fire. So butte, wipe out a whole year. Napa another year, you know, so that's their motivation. They're now saying we got to clean up our forest to sequester more carbon and, and get off this trip of emitting all this carbon. So uh, local capacity right and administer funding. We need foresters and we need licensed timber operators. Oh, and we need infrastructure to what to do with all this biomass. And, you know, we would like to produce electricity with it if we could. And that brings us to our final uh, uh, point is that Calaveras County, uh, we suggest that they convene a forest management task force to develop a comprehensive plan to increase forest resilience to fire, drought, beetle infestation, while sequestering carbon on the landscape level across both private and public lands. Thanks um, for taking questions. Do you have any board questions? Supervisor Oliveira. No, uh, quick question. Cal Fire, on the forest management and health organization that's forming in Sacramento, it's my understanding that they're going to be absorbing Cal Fire, they'll be absorbing tree mortality into one gigantic program. Is that your view of that? Supervisor, I, I don't have any more information on that, I believe, okay. than you have with your contacts and your, uh, I, I believe you're sitting on the... Uh, at least you're attending the tree mortality at the state level of tree mortality task force. So what you know on that subject is what I know. Okay. Um, I can certainly report back to you and go, go find out what I've, I can gather for you. But um, that's what I'm hearing as well. At least they want to move into the realm of looking at forest health as a larger planned issue versus tree mortality as a 
short-term disaster issue. There's a bigger picture to look at here, if you will. Sure, there is. Uh, Pat, your suggestion about a local committee like this hopefully will be dovetailed into that program, and I'm going to make sure that that's brought up and discussed. Okay. Pete, thank you for coming for all of the work that you folks do. Chair, sure, thank you. Can, can, you, can you come up to the microphone and speak oh. so people out I'm watching? Talking about, I'm talking about. Thank you. No, I think Calaveras County has the biggest head start that they could do right now with what's been done here with Pat McGravy Cal Am. To be able to put a group together, as they say, in Calaveras County to be part of all of this and to help keep it going and help keep the management going on, it's really important. You can do the do the initial fire break and all these things here, but the management has to be there and it has to be long term and a county has to be involved in that. There's just no way we can get around that. But you guys have got a pretty big head start with all the work these, you know, that's been done here. I think that uh, I'd hate to see you not grab hold of it and, and uh, grasp it and go on. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Supervisor Garamendi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for that presentation. It's, uh, it's neat to see how all these pieces are coming together. And thanks to all the volunteer work, Jan, and everybody who put all these things together. Um, I also want to thank uh, you. Didn't mention a couple of things in your presentation that I think should be mentioned. You guys have a 3,600-acre project going down in Rancho Calaveras. We're trying to protect uh, out of the out of the Calaveras watershed, running sure. up down down country as well. And that's great, greatly appreciated. And uh, and I know you guys are also milling a lot of the wood that you're bringing out of the Sierra. I spoke to Calvers uh, Unified and asked what they'd done with their wood that you've given them. And you guys have created over Cal Fire and their mill. Uh, 20 gardens have been created, six livestock pens at the high school, picnic tables, uh, 20 projects that will be in the county fair were done with the Cal Fire wood that was given to, uh, to the students. So there's good stuff coming out of there. And, and thank you, as well as multiple other projects, so thank you. You showed that 1926 photo of Tiger Creek. How, how often would it take to maintain that? How often did that burn in order to keep that? I'm thinking in terms of uh, Pat's point about maintenance going forward. I'm, I'm not an expert on the field, but um, what I have been told was uh, pre-Western uh, culture introduction into this hemisphere. You used to look at a cycle of fire that would burn about once every eight to 10 years. And we'll look at the end of the year. Um, so you would have fire that would come through in a low intensity burn about once every eight, eight to 10 years that would uh, clean out the uh, diseased and the dead and keep the brush component under control. As Western civilization came in, we impacted that and then um, over at least the last 70, 80 years, our 100% suppression effort of putting out our fires and doing uh, not the same volume of burning out there, control burn type burns, uh, adds to the fuel loading that you're seeing in those present day pictures. It's not all of it, but it's certainly some of it. Jan Bray, Cal Am team, um, Cam's right. It was primarily the Indians that would set fires, um, typically as they were leaving, so it would be in the fall. And, and their goal was to increase the, the uh, forage because that was their hunting grounds. And, but it, what it did was clear the forest. It continually cleared the forest of brush. And um, the, the conifers that we have are um, fire resilient. So for the most part, um, you had the large pines and the cedars that could have thick barks and they could um, deal with that, whereas the small white fir that you see encroaching nowadays uh, would get burned up. Um, and so they, they occurred in the, in the higher zones. And um, it's important, that's important to note, we're not gonna be able to go back there but I think our fire suppression history in the last 100 years of um, every fire gets put out 
has has is is what we're now inheriting and dealing with. So no toys about the cow fires good at what they do. We're victims of our own success, I guess. <laughs> uh, as Pat and I walked the uh, Highway 4 uh, perimeters, we found fire breaks that had been put in there. And some of the areas grew faster than the others. So I would say there would be a, you asked for time, and there would probably be a 10-year, maybe, deal there. But other areas we saw growth was really working away in there. It was some reason it was getting what it needed. So you would maybe be in a five-year deal where you'd have to take care of those areas. So it's not going to be a set year that you're going to have to do things after you do it. It's going to depend upon how things grow in that area. Thanks, Pete. Uh, quick question. You mentioned, uh, uh, Colonel McGreevy, that we need to expand our capacity uh, for financial management. Are these grants being written through the RCD, or would they be county administered or CAL FIRE? Who is the, uh, the, the administrative body? Really important question. So uh, um, last year, the first two or three grants are, that we've done is uh, through CHIPS in West Point. CHIPS is a 501c3. Um, the, and, uh, and so really what they are is, is uh, all the paperwork passes through CHIPS and uh, the money passes through CHIPS onto Blue Lake Springs, for example. And, um, and CHIPS really makes no decisions. The Blue Lake Springs and people like myself make the decisions. A better solution is working through the Calaveras County uh, uh, RCD, the Resource Conservation District. And the main reason is that, that the RCD has CEQA authority. So I, the grant uh, that I'm writing right now and that Gordon Long is writing, he, re, he representing the RCD, uh, those grants are, are going through uh, the RCD. Now the RCD is young and CAL FIRE I think is, is, is really uh, being generous in giving us a chance to go after this money, which is, uh, which well, this one grant's gonna be $1.7 million and I don't know the other grant's gonna be $1.2 million so that such a young organization is gonna have all this money to, to, to start up with, if, if you will. So uh, in our grants, we're uh, now putting in for a, a manager, business manager, and a field manager. And uh, they're gonna be, I think, a substantial amount because, to get the right people in there to make sure that we do it right and get the RCD off the ground. Thank you. Um, I, I certainly agree with you. This is, uh, you know, by my count, there's 200 million from CAL FIRE and through the two bond measures in June and November, 300 million for the SNC. So that's 500 million. It's even a bigger apple. But I, mean, I really do see this as an economic driver for our community. I mean, these are new dollars being brought into the community for people who are gonna be working here. Um, coming or going, buying gas, putting tires on their truck, working and living here. So it's very important that we find a way to participate with you. In your recommendations, um, you mentioned a hazardous fuel ordinance, and that sounds like a county, something we might be able to do. You want to unpack that a little bit? Very unpopular, probably. <laughs> um, oh. So the reason the, uh, these fires get out of hand, Butte, I'll just use the Butte fire. You know, the Butte fire started by PG&E in Amador County, and it went all the way across and bur burnt houses in Mountain Ranch. So the point, an important point that we don't seem to read about very much is that PG&E didn't ignite the house in Mountain Ranch. That each, it went the domino effect, each parcel to parcel to parcel to parcel. So all these people who allowed fire fuel on their parcels, um, has large amounts of hazardous fuel, deserve some culpability, really. So the real issue is how do we get our landowners our, uh, uh, to uh, clean up their land? And BLM's a good example. They've been underfunded, um, under, uh, under, under uh, uh, manpowered for generations, and their land looks like it. Um, and, and so we have a real opportunity now, because the grants coming out from CARB, this $300 million, there aren't very many restrictions on them. In the past, we couldn't spend money on maintenance. CARB doesn't care, they just want the land cleared off. 
In the past, we could only spend it in, on you know, uh, federal ownership or whatnot. Today, they don't care. Uh, we can spend this money on, uh, on uh, CCWD land, on private land, on Forest Service land, federal land. It does, it, we have, it, it's up to our creativity to spend that money wisely. Let me give you a, a really a, a topic that grinds on me all the time. That fire came, Butte fire came over Highway 26 and it burned, what, some 72,000 acres or something. If, remember that big red area in the, member, in the middle of those slides? And that, you go up to Jesus Maria and you look to, <clears throat> to uh, San Andreas and that's what it burned. And that land, it, right now, the brush is one foot tall. One foot tall. So next year it's gonna be two feet tall and pretty soon it's gonna be 10 feet tall and the only chance we have then is another boot fire. So there's a phenomenon called ecotype replacement. So when a real hot fire comes through, burns everything off, sterilizes the ground and, and kills all the conifer seeds and the oak seeds and, and whatnot. That's what we're into in the, butte, in the butte footprint. You didn't see in any of our slides any activity in terms of fuels reduction inside that butte footprint. We're just sitting back as observers and watching it grow. I think this is a good problem for the RCD and their, their ranchers that are on the RCD and that are they're interested in range, rangeland restoration. Well, I would like to, uh, looking at that and talking with, uh, looking at what Ebbets Paths did, I was hoping that perhaps this board at some point in the near future can take up that issue of hazardous fuel ordinance so that when people are not maintaining or they're absentee landowners, not allowing grazing, just put up a fence and walked away, uh, back to LA, we actually have some, uh, we could actually go in and abate that if we have to, and then we'll charge them if they want to fix their land. And Ebbets Pass Fire Department already does that. Exactly, and I think we ought to take a look at that. Uh, my final question is the forest management task force that you mentioned, can we take the tree mortality task force and transition into into that and sort of we've got momentum, we've got everybody in the room, the state has taken their task force and expanded it. Can we, do you think it's a good idea for us to transition as well? I've waffled on this issue and uh, today, this is, I believe that we need a small core group of folks. We need a couple of uh, for, uh, foresters, we need uh, some loggers, uh, we need some geographic uh, representation. Oh, we need, um, emergency services, we need um, economic development. So a very small group of people and let them go out and contact the, the resources that, they, that they, they need to gather information. I, I sent you that memo, it's, it's a two pager I think that with just a bunch of bullets and things that need to be done, it's, it's overwhelming. So what I would do is have this uh, small force, task force, take one issue at a time, come and work it up, and come back with their report each month to the Board of Supervisors for their consideration, something like that, and work our way through the list of, of things that are feasible for uh, Calaveras County to, to do to support the, the larger effort. Supervisor Mill, do you have a question? Well, I, I'm not sure if it's a question or how we're gonna frame this, uh, but having fought fires in the past, we fight the fire and go home. And oftentimes we left the results for others to deal with, uh, especially local resources. I think that what I'm looking at here is a, a strategic shift in post-fire management and in essence developing some type of uh, emergency action plans pre-fire uh, so that we fully and clearly understand what that urban interface model will look like in our county based upon where our fire progression is most likely to occur. The RCD, you said it was in an infancy, and I understand that. But how quickly are they going to be able to ramp up, I think is the question for them, uh, to gain a full understanding of their administrative capability? Because this will represent a million dollars or more to them if they do it right, just in that one project alone. I think the RCD has the support of California State RCD. Jan, you might want to uh, come in on this, but. Uh, there's a number of people looking over the shoulder of Gordon and, and uh, the RCD, and none of us are gonna let it fail. 
So uh, we know how important that RCD is to Calaveras County. An another resource that's available to Calaveras and Amador is UMRA as well. So um, I know they have um, signed a stewardship agreement with the El Dorado and the Stanislaus, and, and they have a lot of uh, management capability and, and a lot of experience with their different water agencies. And so that may be another source that we could utilize. Okay. Let me come back to that, uh, mm -hmm. that committee, that uh, task force. I'd also make the task force Calaveras Amador. When you read that, that list, it's the same list that, that Jan's gonna present to the Amador board next month. Um, so, and you're gonna have the same people on the board. Tim Tate, for example, that's the mm -hmm. kind of guy you want on the board. And you want Jan, and she's from Amador County. Why exclude these people from one county or the other? So they could be working, the task force could be working up one issue and report to both boards. The uh, Tuolumne County, in approving their master stewardship agreement, took in the components of the Cornerstone Project and YSS. And I know that our own staff is working to um, fill in the gaps, so to speak, because ours, even though it couldn't be a duplicate of it, could be using theirs as a template, and I know Mariposa County is doing likewise. This will basically encompass the entire Stanislaw National Forest. I think it gives us a heads up over any other Foothills County in being able to put multiple counties together under that same kind of an umbrella, and, uh, and that will speed up the process uh, through the uh, EAs and, and, and looking at Okay, environmental what? Assessments? Assessment. <laughs> okay, I just, you, you get into the short form for, for him, so I just wanna be sure to say it. But I think that master stewardship agreement in Calaveras County would be a critical tool in, in accomplishing a lot of what we wanna accomplish because SPI by themselves or the Forest Service by themselves uh, are limited to some degree. And I've had those conversations with SPI and the Forest Service. Um, I was there, just gonna go add, ahead. Supervisor Mills, that, mm -hmm. um, that this collaborative that we do have in place is, is we've, we're already six-tenths of the way there. So, you know, like you said, instead of the Forest Service by themselves or CAL FIRE by themselves, it's a collaborative and we've had these, the collaborative in place in Amador County for over 10 years and in Calaveras now for three, so. And we know what you're capable of at this point. And, and me being a water guy, I'm, I'm gonna always be thinking about what are the watershed effects, what improvements can be made to supplying a better quality of water into the state or the federal water project systems, uh, as well as improving our water quality here for our wells and, and our surface water. So it's, it's a larger thing, but I, I see this as a unique moment in time that may not happen again for a long time and that the state and the federal government and our local resources are all getting on the same page. Uh, I'm gonna tell you in government, that's difficult. <laughs> and you know that. So uh, push forward and know that you have at least my support from this board uh, to accomplishing what you need to accomplish. Because the last thing we need to do is to see more homes burned and more lives lost. Get the right people at the right time. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you are having a deal now. You have a committee that's looking at the PRC 4291 CAL FIRE rules. Uh, don't turn it off. Don't, don't, Pat, don't turn it off. And that's part of the program that uh, I, the county needs to be really behind. I know that they're looking at it for, I, I was talked to about going over and trying to explain what that is for and how it works because I've been heavily involved in it, but that is a crucial uh, backing that you continue that you've done it through the years and it's been great but there needs to be a strong ordinance that puts the people on notice the real estate people have done a good job of putting in their their flyers that you must when you buy a home here in Calaveras County you must comply with PRC 4290 rule if you own a home here so I think a strong wording coming from the council maybe even stronger you know, from the county might even help with that and help Cal Fire out too. But, but that's really important to all of this. This whole thing is, is all together. And can you can you sorry. go back to the slide that you showed at the beginning with all the fires that have the 
entire county up there and it showed the fire. Back there. right there. Um, I was going to stay out of this fight because I don't really have a dog in it right now because you excluded this end of the county on your presentation. However, only because we had 20 minutes, I would have loved to have shown you a lot more. <laughs> and, and, and I understand, that's why I'm just going to stay out of this. However, when, gra when Pat was bringing up the height of the grass um, in some of the areas he was speaking of in the fire breaks, in 2006, there was a fire that's, that came from right in this area right here and swept all the way up through here. And it was started by a motorhome that pulled off, that had a muffler problem that pulled off Burson Road into high grass. Memorial Day weekend. Yes. And the wind blew and it, was, it destroyed structures up through there. So even this end of the county, when you're talking about um, fire breaks, I know you are working down in this area right now in Rancho Calaveras area, but this area is now, since 2006, is back in the same state it was back then as far as fuel. And so I'd be very interested in, in maybe collaborating some of the work that's going to be, you're talking about up here with RCD and, and possibly um, looking at some of these areas and some of the fuel reduction possibilities that can be done in that area because those canyons, there are some canyons into there and that, that's what raced up, that really what fueled it once it got going off the road was raging up through those canyons. And I'm telling you, uh, the, the fuel is there for it to happen again. It could happen this summer because um, there's been very little maintenance done or clearing in that area right there, so. You want to take that or you want me to take it? Uh, well, I'll talk about the fire because I was the operations chief on that fire. <laughs> Were you? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so very familiar with the Patterson fire, and uh, you are correct. And um, I, I think what I would say to this body is, we gave you a sampling of what's going on in the county. I don't think it's an issue that is um, exclusive to one of your districts or another. It's our it's our county, mm -hmm. and the Patterson mm -hmm. fire. We lost 17 homes. That was a big fire, and I considered putting it on here as well. Um, there are a number of others. We had uh, big yes, fires yes. in Copperopolis. We had the Calderas yes, complex, and, and on and on yes. and on. If we had put every fire on here, you would have looked yeah, at the, a, the, a the, map of red. Yeah, the whole the whole county was not for red. So we had to pick specifics, but I agree. And the only the last thing that I will say is um, there has been up to date a lot of collaborative effort going on around our county. There's room for more, and my agency wants to work with the county and with these other entities in any way we can to do more preventative efforts and do these landscape scale um, endeavors, if you will, that are listed in that little Hoover Commission report. So I would um, add, I would put the challenge right back to you, Gary. I'd say I've already said that there's only two grant writers so far in 2018 and I happen to live on the east, on the east side of Highway 49. I know where, I know where you live. <laughs> I know you. So We've my, known each other for a long time. My interest, <laughs> you know, is, is really up and there. I, I, and I, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I said I was going to stay out of this fight. But, but there, there was, and I, I want to join into the fight is what I'm saying. So, so I, I will collaboratively work towards some of those efforts. Get us a grant writer in your, in your community, and we'll, uh, we'll train them. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll do it. Okay. One of the things to pay attention to, if you go west on Highway 4, is the ranchers have cut next to Highway 4. Those, those are uh, trails already in there, all the way down to the county line. Uh, on some of it, on both sides of the highways. You know, when you talk about your major highways, the ranchers can contribute by pre-cutting those, uh, those lines in. So we have a defensible space between the roadway where we're more likely to get a fire and especially major roadways. Uh, but the thing about the fires in Copperopolis, and I'm very familiar with those, those are those 40 mile an hour runners. They, they get up and they, they'll outrun you every day. Uh, and then it's the bunny rabbits and the, uh, the pheasants that take off that you gotta knock down. But uh, you know, this is all 
uh, where where public understands what they can do, what role they can play, and how they can help to improve the, the odds, improve the chances, even in the low country, and we get that education out to them, make them aware of, of the options, and to, and to do some pre-fire planning on their own part, on their own properties, would make a big difference, even for their neighbors. Okay, I'm gonna open this up to public comments. Public comments. Well, what a great presentation, and uh, has some pretty good recommendations. We seem to be focused on <clears throat> grant writing and public solutions. Uh, this kind of revert, goes back to the taxpayer who's going to fund this. And uh, I'm Al Segala with the Taxpayer Association. Uh, about 30 years ago, more or less, we, an attitude was developed uh, almost anti-logging environment. Uh, timber, timber harvesters were bad. They were tearing down the forest, they're cut and run, all kinds of, capitalism was evil. And now, we're facing the consequences of that attitude. We've almost destroyed private timber harvesting in our county, especially private harvesting on public lands. And so if we could break away from that box of, uh, and start thinking like capitalists a little bit, and consider that timber is a good thing. Timber is a good thing. And also, it really contributes to economic development. So, we talk a little bit about collab collaboration with the private sector, that is good, but we need to put more emphasis on that. We need to talk to the timber industry about major uh, management of our forests by private timber interests, either on the forest or long-term contracts. Federal government right now, we know how long it lasts, is, uh, is friendly to business. There's a good chance, uh, at least according to our, our uh, congressman, that uh, we could revive the timber industry. If we can do that, we'll have so many solutions coming down here without resorting to the taxpayers. Does it make sense? Thank you. Um, this is in response to something Al just mentioned, that the anti-timber harvesting was considered evil and horrible. I think what we were talking about in those days was clear-cutting, the total destruction of a forest land, and the, uh, not just the, the elimination of all the trees, but the tearing up of the, the ground and, and everything on it. Um, and I was one of those people that didn't want our forests, forests destroyed in that manner. But we're to, we were talking about clear cutting, which is the total elimination of, of everything that seemed to be living. A grant writer in District 5, there's a woman named Muriel Zeller who is very proficient in grant writing. She might be uh, available to be reached out to. Uh, sh her family has been in ranching for years and understands the importance of maintaining some uh, renewable resources. And also, uh, she's involved in a group of, of writers who have the ability to use the words in the right way Maybe not grant writers, but people that can um, respond to um, the need of our community in a way that might be um, appealing to the people that fund those sort of things. Anyway, those are the two thoughts that I had as I was sitting here listening to y'all. Any other public comments? I have a good imagination. And when I drive from here over to Mariposa County and take the way, the Coulterville way, um, when I look at those mountains, I see Ponderosa Pines. What is growing there right now is probably nothing because a big fire went through there just recently. But 
what breaks my heart is allowing brush to just grow indiscriminately and close in on the entire mountainside. And I know that the answer to it is, is to eliminate the brush as it comes up and just dab a little roundup on it when it starts to re-sprout. That's not being done in California and it breaks my heart. Any other public comments? Seeing none, I'll close public comments. Bring it back to the board, any last comments? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. You can turn that off now. Mr. Chair. Pat, you can turn it off. Mr. Chair, I think we have another presentation next. Can we have a five minute break? Yes, we'll take a five minute break to set up. Well. All right, we're back in session. Madam Clerk, item number 21. Item 21 is from the Public Works Department to adopt a resolution to incorporate the list of projects funded by SB1, the Road Repair Accountability Act, into fiscal year 2018-19 Public Works Department Roads and Bridges Division budget. Mr. Krovitz. Thank you, Jeff Krovitz, Public Works. Um, uh, I assume the board can recall back into the fall when we did this for the very first time, which was to develop a list of projects um, for the life of the, uh, the SB1 program and select or provide a list of projects to the CTC that would allow um, the county to receive this funding as it comes in. Uh, we are returning for the next year's allocation um, on the list of projects. Uh, we utilized the same two, pro the same list that we had developed the previous year with some modifications and some additions to it um, using criteria that we both developed within Public Works and some criteria that we received from uh, board input. Um, the, the important thing about the list is that it's extremely flexible. The list is required um, so that we are eligible for funding. We are not necessarily required to execute that list um, in the year predicted or even ex execute the projects on that list. We are required to report to CTC when a project is completed utilizing these funds. Um, this is coming a bit early, um, but I think it's okay. Um, the projects that we are proposing would be within the estimated funding of um, about $2.3 million, which is good, um, only two projects. One is a reconstruction project that's quite expensive up on Parrots Ferry Road. Um, there is an over steep and slope and underground water that's causing a very slow collapse of that roadway. Um, it reached its level of importance um, and prioritization because of its um, regional importance. It is a major co connector to uh, not only recreational resources within the county, but also to Tuolumne County. Uh, the second project added was a, um, uh, a chip seal. We tried to pick projects that were the highest priority ones that would be within the uh, uh, estimated funding, which we did on the last round. So, um, and I think really I would take questions from you um, that you have. We are in a little bit of a time crunch because CTC is wanting this list of projects on the 1st of May. So this was our opportunity. Supervisor Mills, your light's on. So let's say, for instance, SB1 is going to be on the ballot in November. Constitutional amendment. And it fails. I mean, we reject SB1. And will there be a wind down period where funds will continue to flow through to a certain point? Do we know exactly what that might entail? I don't really know the answer to that. Um, my assumption is that there would be a wind down period because there is a delay, um, meaning that when the program started in November of 2017, uh, the first funding that came to Calaveras County was very late December um, 
through today. So the assumption, of course, is, is that once the program is, if the program is voted to be cut off, there would be that same kind of a transition down out of the program. Because I look at this Parrots Ferry Road project as it could easily become something quite serious and we don't have the SB1 funding, for instance, if it does, we do have that ballot measure go through. Um, we're going to be having to find some options somewhere else to make this happen. And that means other, other things will have to be set aside, simply because this is a major collector road for Districts 3 and 4 into Sonora. Mm -hmm. So I just, uh, just want us to be aware that that possibility could exist. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions on these two selections. Um, the previous round, um, I did not have anything on that list. I did not have anything on that list. Um, and we discussed that when it came before the board. Um, and I'm looking at the two projects that you are promoting today. And again, District 1 has been excluded from the list. Um, I think three other districts on the previous selection were all represented there. I think um, Supervisor Garamendi and myself We're saying that we would look, we would go ahead with those selections, um, provided the next round we would have some inclusion. And if you look at District 1, it is um, at a score of 37 points versus the railroad flat, which is in District 2, which is a 32, but you've gone from um, 50 to 32. Um, so I'm wondering when it is that you think um, the possibility exists that we may be able to get something in District 1 included in SB1 funding. The Or as we are responsible for the maintenance throughout the entire county, um, we try to build our list based upon the highest priorities throughout the entire county and then give criteria to that. Um, the issue with Railroad Flat coming up in front of Burson, even though it's less, it had less points in the, in the matrix, also was affordable within the next year's funding. And so um, while we try to take the ones with the highest priority or the highest points um, in the scoring criteria, we are also taking those that are affordable. So, um, and again, th while this is a list of projects, they are a prior prioritized list of projects. We, if, if necessary, we can bring others in front um, we still have to bring to the board. We still have to go through um, all of our processes of uh, request for bids and then award of contracts um, as well as closure. So this board or any board sees these projects multiple times before they come up. My anticipation is depending upon what the funding, the funding is for that given year, we are trying to take it in chunks. Um, and while Supervisor Tofanil, I would love to be able to deliver projects in all five districts, that's not affordable. Um, and so um, we are hoping that by going with a, a criteria of scoring and affordability, uh, it's at least uh, approximately fair. Chair, would, would one of the th options be to look at segmenting some of these larger projects to 
keep them into the affordability scale uh, and assist in getting them, which especially the, the 50s, the high priorities, are pulled up. And they're, they're simply not even in the option list right now because they're so expensive. Is, is that a thought that we break them up into smaller projects? I don't know, that's not, I mean, that's public works to decide how to break them up or what have you. Uh, but we did have a board discussion on this and I'm looking at, at, at uh, one of the projects in District 1 that would be 1.5 million and I'm looking at a 1.5 million in your district at Douglas Flat. Um, and we previously, in the previous allocations, had projects in District 4. Um, so I, you know, I'm just looking for um, some District 1 representation here um, as we go forward. Again, it, we don't know what's going to happen in November on a ballot that's coming forward, but we are spending funds um, in every area now, it looks like, except for District 1. Um, and that I have a problem with. Supervisor Clapp. Gary, I, I think right now we're just trying to get something so we can get the funds since, because he has to have the list from my understanding the first of next month. And uh, I agree with you because I, I think other things has to be considered because right now I know there's 200 homes getting ready to go in in your district but uh, behind uh, Gold Creek and there's also a subdivision for 50 something in Valley Springs going in. So those things have, you know, if we're going to be putting those kind of homes in your district, we need to have the roads to carry them. I mean, I, you know, because our districts are somewhat close together, and I agree with you because most of the people in my district goes down Burson to get to Lodi. But I think right now we're just trying to get something so we can get because I do agree with you, and I agree with Jack, too, on just the statements we made earlier before we went to lunch. But um, I think right now we're just at the point trying to get Jeff to authorize something so we can get the funding, and we'll bring it back at that point. And this is just for funding, not for projects. You can put the projects you want, but we're not committing to them. That's, that's how I would be voting on. Have we received any of the first disbursement and have we done any of these projects um, that were listed in green? Uh, we haven't started any of the projects we've received uh, of the estimated $814,000 estimate to date, 186,000. And so, um, Looking at last year's list of projects, um, we're trying to make sure that we have complete funding before we pick off one or two of the projects. And if at all possible, um, if we can't do a, a single large project, it would be nice to be able to do a smaller project of similar type. So you have received $186,000? To date. And, and um, is there a idea to bring any of those projects before you start back to this board? Yes, we have to. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I'll open up public comments. Uh, Al Segala, Taxpayer Association. That's a good point. What's more important, the district boundaries or the, the need of the county? It seemed like the highest priority uh, feasible uh, road repair would be more important than going to a particular uh, district or supervisor. Uh, there may be some things where districts would be more important, but when it comes to roads, it doesn't seem like that, that would fly. Uh, now, one of the things that I think the uh, the auditor controller was concerned about was long-term planning on projects. In other words, uh, the county needs to have a plan, not just for um, grant funding, but a plan that would, that would look ahead 20, 30 years and actually uh, analyze the needs uh, of our roads and plan a process of meeting those needs. And if some of that is grant funded, great, uh, but we have a, if we don't have enough local uh, uh, distribution of our gas tax, maybe we should be talking to our state representatives about increasing the money that goes to our county 
from our own taxes that our people are paying. Uh, as for uh, uh, the uh, gas tax, I don't think that, I think that's going to pass. I think the public's not going to go for that uh, gas tax. Uh, for, well, you know, the, you know the arguments against and the arguments for. And uh, true, we do need improvements of our roads. But that, that particular gas tax is really bad in several ways. It's similar to the, uh, to the uh, uh, fire tax. It's, it's not an honest tax. Um, anyway, that's my comments. Thank you. Bill Wilson, District 1. My God, the roads in Calaveras County are crumbling, and we can't seem to pay for them or get them fixed in certain districts. Amazing. Too bad we didn't have tax money that was coming into the county from a legal regulated business. Really a shame. I know there's potholes on Pool Station Road. There's potholes on Highway 4, Highway 12, Highway 26. There's holes in everything around here. It used to be developers would pay for that infrastructure. I don't know why it isn't in the in infrastructure. They want roads. They want to build houses. They want to bring people in here. They're not bringing jobs. They're bringing people. Those people have to work out of this county. They don't work in this county. They are a bedroom community to Stockton, Lodi, Modesto, anywhere else but Calaveras County where there are no jobs. Minimum wage jobs, county jobs, state jobs, but no real jobs. Anyway, gentlemen, I don't know if you'll ever get asphalt on the road. We didn't want an asphalt plant in District 5, did we? I think we recalled the supervisor for that reason because he was going to try to get an asphalt plant there so it was cheaper for asphalt to be used on the roads in the lower half of the county. But we don't want that kind of stuff in Calaveras anymore, do we? We'd rather have holes in the road, right? Isn't that the way it goes? Thank you very much. District 1 includes San Andreas, Burson, Valley Springs, and Wallace. And there's no provision for anything for them, which includes me. I object to this. This is not justice or fair. And that's what I thought we were about. Any other public comments? Seeing none, I'll close public comments. Bring it back to the board. Supervisor Oliveira, your light is on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Clovis, I have a couple of questions. Scenario, remove SB1 funding for roads and using our anticipated resources we have for 17-18, if we had money to spend on a project, and I'm going to use the project listed here on Parrots Ferry Road and the one on South Burson Road. They're both about a $1.5 million project. One's repaving, one's a road structure reconstruction. Which one is the uh, more dangerous at this time? I would have to say Parrots Ferry. Why would you say that? Um, because of the danger of loss of the roadway. Um, as opposed to, um, well, th they're both dangerous. Uh, Thank you. That's the only fair thing to say. Okay. Um, but the cost of losing a, uh, a roadway cut into the side of a mountain and having to reconstruct it, um, that risk is greater than having to go back in on the Burson and rebuild the structural section, which is also very expensive. Uh, it's a, pay, a repaving job on South Person Road. And that's a 20 year life on that. How long have we been putting that off? Any idea? No. More than five years? Oh, absolutely. More than 10 years? Probably. More than 20 years? Mm. I've lived there 20 years and never been paid. Looks like we didn't do our job 20 years ago, right? 
we didn't have the main maintenance that these asphalt roads and even Parrott's Ferry Road, which has extenuating circumstances with a spring and a base collapse of the road. Am I correct? Yeah, and, a, and an over steep and slope. Slope was constructed too steep on the downhill side. Yeah. So we have an extreme situation potentially mm -hmm. on Parrott's Ferry Road. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get into a contest with Supervisor Tofanelli. I understand his position. But we have to do what we have to do with what we have to the most serious situations. Without SB1 funding, how are we going to fix these, uh, these uh, incidents? We will do less. What can you do less on Parrots Ferry? Um, <laughs> what could you do less on South Person Road? Less would be continuing what we've been doing, which is occasional patching. Okay. And, and I, I just bring this up for information. It looks like our pivot point is going to be SB1 funding for these both serious situations. And I, I, I apologize if I offended you, Supervisor Tofanelli, but bottom line is, which is the more dangerous situation and what, what do we have to fix it? Thank you. Um, to that, um, Capo Seco Road is on here too. And when was the last time it was paved? I've, I've lived there 30 years. I've never seen it paved at all. Um, as a matter of fact, it could be considered a third world road half the time. It's narrow and as huge as it, as it is. Um, as far as divots and potholes and patches and what have you. Um, so that, that is one. And also we have uh, Comanche Road uh, Parkway. Um, I don't think it's in that, it, it's as bad a shape as either Burson or, or Campo Seco. But certainly, um, you know, I, I, I understand what Mr. Um, or Supervisor Oliveira is saying. But some of the other roads are, are, are just as dangerous, and maybe not the side of a mountain, but some of these other ones are very dangerous in passing and very critical to um, not only um, people being able to access their homes, but um, for instance, I bring up Burson Road. Uh, Burson Road is a major thoroughfare from Highway 12 to Highway 26. Otherwise, you have to go all the way around in the case of an emergency for emergency vehicles um, in through Valley Springs and all the way around to access the other side near Milton Road uh, on Highway 26. If there is an accident there or any other emergency or what have you, um, there's another road called South Hospital that I won't even get into um, as far as trying to travel that, because um, um, if you travel that, you're probably going to need a front end alignment when you get to the other end of it. Um, it's not in very good shape whatsoever, and there are hillsides and so forth there. So, you know, I don't even see it listed here um, on any of these projects. Um, so, you know, my question is um, again, if you just look at Campo Seco Road, it's lower on the priority, yes, but it, the, the cost that it's associated with here is very low. I, I'm, I'm trying to get some representation here on my stand for District 1. Um, however, I understand what Supervisor Oliveira is saying when it comes to safety. I think we all have in our district um, particular areas that are not very safe on roads traveled um, that our constituents must pass through in order to get to their place of residence. So, Supervisor Mills, your light is on. There are many, many roads in Calaveras County that are third world roads. That's, That's just reality. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, and I'm looking at Al because he's familiar with the area about Moccasin, Signal Hill Trail, La Crosse Court. There are many of these places where the road isn't there anymore, it's just gravel. Yeah. 
<laughs> it, they're just not. But the, those that I speak to aren't really pothole divoted. They're just turned to gravel. So, um, you know, that's the question that even Tuolumne County had is, and they asked themselves, do we allow some of our paved roads to turn to gravel and start treating them as graveled roads rather than paved roads simply because we can't oil base them? Or, you know, we don't have the funding to do it. And I, I just want to repeat that my priority is for the good of the whole county. And if it's District 2, for instance, that is the priority, then that's where the focus has to be because I think our, our road department, our public works people, understand full and well where they can minimize the damage with the most amount of dollars. And I, I really have to trust them and rely on them to have a good understanding of what that is. So politics aside, uh, you know, I'd love to have all the money in my district too. <laughs> but it's, the reality is, is that we are going to be faced with some of those critical decisions of do we let some of these roads become gravel roads simply because we can't maintain them, especially the secondary or tertiary roads that just we don't have the capability. So I just want that honest discussion out there as we make our decisions that it's not, I, I agree. I think collector roads or primary roads, they have to be considered as priority. And we do what we can to keep them as maintained as possible. So thank you. Supervisor Clapp, your light's on. Uh, I would just be regurging this, the same thing. I know because uh, you, you're having nearly 250 homes put in your district. Uh, Woodbridge is, is, could go with 98 homes tomorrow. It's already approved, they can start building. So, you know, you basically want to put 400 homes in one small area and the roads can't hold what we have now. So, you know, we just, you know, and plus in my district, we, we generate 40, roughly $45 million probably just in 150 homes and, and uh, property tax probably value, probably roughly around 300,000 a home. And, uh, we, you know, we either have to quit building in the areas. I, I Wilson, I, I totally agree with them. I mean, the uh, the builders have to start putting up the off-street improvements. I mean, we let them slide way too long. We have 50 new homes on all of Orchard now that the road can't carry, and uh, and we that has to be considered considered. I mean, a lot of the developers in my area, and I'm a developer, don't care for me. Because when they come to me, they're told they have to do that. Because I won't be, I won't, I won't support if they don't. And I think that's just what the board has to start looking at. If they bring the, if they come here, we have, they have to, you know, pay for the expansion of the waters, pay for the expansion of the sewer. Because when Rancho went in, there was nothing there. They had to build it all. Same thing with Lockatena. They had to build the sewer facilities. And the new developers are coming in. They're just sort of like a free ride. And you know, we we can't afford to do that. So, Chair, would, uh, would rim fees be something that the board might want to consider as an alternative? Because you have that in your area, I have it in Copperopolis, uh, as another means of combining our resources to find the best solution for the dollars that are available. I think that needs to be a broader discussion at a future point, but i just like to get it into our topic now so that we know that money is out there. Supervisor Oliveri, your light's on. Yeah, just, just a quick note. Uh, I too have a concern for the entire county. Uh, I'm, Supervisor Mills mentioned rim fees on the 250 home project. That could be considered some type of funding. But gentlemen, we this is a problem we've inherited. It should have been addressed a while ago. And now we're trying to fix this in a short period of time that took a long time to happen. So we've got to be pretty we've got to be pretty reasonable about how we approach this. And I think the situations must be geared towards the most dangerous situations and using the best bang for our buck. When we come to funding like SB1, if we get SB1, that's still to be decided by the voters. So I call him once again, Supervisor Tofanelli, I'm on your side. But the bottom line is well I'm, I'm going to support this but again I expected to come back to the board before we dig in with any project and then I'm really would like to know um, when we get the first round fully funded um, where we're what um, what time frame we're at I mean it's been we're now going into May um, 
and I thought the first installment was going to be complete to us sometime before June. So that was my understanding at the time. So hopefully we'll get the windfall here for round one in the next few weeks. So um, that being said, I'm open for a motion. I will move adding uh, these to the list so that we can continue to stay on the SB1 funding cycle. I'm looking for a second. A second, Pat. I have a motion by Supervisor Mills, a second by Supervisor Clapp. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 4 0. Madam Clerk, on to item number 22. Item 22 is from the Administrative Office to receive a presentation by various departments on the prior year's illegal cannabis grow eradication and abatement activities and the proposed next fiscal year's enforcement program and structure. Good afternoon, board. Um, we're going to be presenting an overview of a little bit of history before the cannabis uh, changes in the emergency ordinance, give a little bit of statistics give a lessons learned, and then we're going to go off on how we see the future after ban. And we have a team here today. We have a lot of uh, questions or answers you want to do. We had a little bit of a revision last minute, so I'll be able to explain that later. Uh, but if you have questions, feel free to do it. And we're going to be coming up, starting off with, I think, the presentation as it comes up here. Has, ever, has the public gotten the copies? I'm Come sorry, on. Ed. It looks yes. like that projector got turned off. Oh, if okay. you wouldn't mind switching it back on for me. Supervisor, you want to get the lights? Yeah. Last revised page. Revised page. There it goes, Ed. You're good. Yep, it's open. Anybody else need any copies? So as Ed said as well, um, the presentation, we went back and forth on some costs. I'm at the very end is when we talk about staffing. Um, I'm asking code to provide an overview for why they feel their numbers where, it at, where it's at, because I'll be honest, I have some concerns on the latter number. Um, so the way that we set this up at the request of the board, was to um, allow a, a different departments to make um, reports on both some of their statistics, but then also some of the activities. And um, so with that, we had kind of laid out planning department, building the sheriff, um, and then um, of course the, the summary or, or wrap up. So I think Peter, Peter is first up to kind of talk about on um, his side for the wrap up of the urgency ordinance. Well, that is exactly where we're at. We're, we are wrapping things up. Uh, we have until June 7th when the um, final 90 days winds down from the effective date of the, uh, the ban ordinance. Uh, we've, the numbers here show you sort of where we're at right now. Uh, you know, over 300 have been denied. A little over 200 have been approved. We've got Actually, 109, I just checked before coming down here, 109 that are still in process. We anticipate having those completed within the next uh, few weeks. Uh, and then we'll be wrapping up the um, appeal process. We will not be directly involved in the enforcement uh, aspect of it, other than to provide assistance where needed to the sheriff and to um, the um, code enforcement um, officers. I really don't have anything else to add. The uh, presentation is really primarily on moving forward with enforcement against uh, illegal activities. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm certainly here to try to answer those. Great. Thank you. And now um, next up, code enforcement will be kind of provide an overview. And Sabrina, if you guys are talking, I can let you drive the PowerPoint. Okay. Board for allowing us the opportunity to present today. I, I just do want to announce that as uh, Sabrina was just promoted to senior code enforcement officer, so this will be her first presentation. So <laughs> give her a little break sometime today. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have to admit, Mr. Short, I had to ask Supervisor Garamendi who the young lady was <laughs> sitting at the table. <laughs> so we'll begin with. Um, 
a brief retrospective on code enforcement in cannabis. So I think it'll provide a better understanding of where we are now and where we hope to be in the future. As we all know, it began in 2016 with the passage of the urgency ordinance, which imposed two obligations on code compliance. The first was regulatory inspections, and the second was administrative enforcement and abatement of illegal cannabis activities. Under the old chapter 806, which is the chapter of county code that governs code enforcement, cannabis was treated like an ordinary nuisance and a property owner or occupant had 20 days to appeal a citation to the administrative hearing board, which is the planning commission wearing a different hat. Decisions of the hearing board were sent to the board of supervisors for, as a recommendation for review. Under the old system, it took at least 50 days from the issuance of a citation to the execution of an abatement warrant. Violators took advantage of this lengthy timeline to delay enforcement action through to harvest. And in 2016, although approximately 70 citations were issued for unregistered cannabis cultivation, only one abatement order was actually executed before harvest. So what did we learn? Cannabis cultivation has unique impacts that require time-sensitive action. After a frustrating first year, we felt sort of stymied and developed a new process and strategy. And in February 2017, an updated version of Chapter 806 was adopted. Under the new 806, the County of Administrative Hearings was established for expedited review of cannabis-only cases. Citations, orders to abate, and orders to show cause were served in the form of a three-in-one notice. Our procedures were standardized, and under this new system, an abatement order could issue just 15 days after a citation was served. Much better than 50 days. So to start the 2017 season, with the help of GIS, TIFs, complaints, and field investigations, we were able to identify approximately 1,000 unregistered commercial sized cultivation sites. And I just wanna take a moment to speak to the importance of our GIS team. They are crucial in the success of cannabis enforcement and unsung heroes, I believe. So uh, code enforcement divided the county into four beats and one full-time code enforcement officer was assigned to each beat responsible for all cannabis enforcement in their area. What I consider to be a very successful year, 228 citations were issued for unregistered cannabis cultivation. And of those 228 citations, 213 voluntary abated. 59 individuals failed to abate in a timely manner and accrued a total of $536,000 in fines. And no, voluntary compliance does not equal harvest, contrary to popular belief. We had a 93% compliance rate. Here's an example of self-abated plants. You can see they're very unusable. I'm missing some slides here. Are there more slides, Tim? Uh-oh. I thought I had about 20. Yeah, I was going to say, I have more too. Is it? There we yeah, go. Yeah, there it is. Right there. Thank you, Tim. This is an example of a form that a self-abating site would have to sign. It's a declaration of voluntary abatement and also a consent to on-site inspection, which would have to be notarized or signed in the presence of a code enforcement officer. It gave us a right of entry for 120 days after it was signed. And officers did personally verify on-site that the marijuana, or excuse me, cannabis was actually abated. In 2017, we executed 14 county abatement warrants and their total plant count, both voluntary and county abated, was 47,076. But we did face some challenges. Code enforcement officers funded through the regulatory fee fund were restricted from <coughs> handling ordinary code cases. Regular code enforcement, off, or code, code enforcement fell by the wayside and in 2017 we had just 0.75 full-time equivalent employee responsible for all regular code enforcement and abandoned vehicle abatement in the county. The dual track appeals process made the issuance of non-cannabis citations complicated. And what I mean by that is regular code enforcement still went through the former appeals process, the administrative hearing board to the board of supervisors. 
<clears throat> and we learned a lot. Actual costs were not recovered for any of the voluntary abatements. The need for an updated fee schedule became apparent, and we also had a very low voluntary payment of fines. We received 87,000 of the aforementioned 536,000, which is a 16% collection rate. And looking to the future, cannabis enforcement remains a very high priority for code enforcement. Last season in 2017, we had four full-time officers dedicated exclusively to cannabis. And now we have only three full-time <coughs> equivalent code officers to handle all code matters, including cannabis. Additional enforcement burdens of site remediation requirements of the new 1795 were also placed on code enforcement. That includes ensuring prevention of soil erosion and sediment runoff and site restoration of former cultivation sites. Making sure that sites that were illegally graded obtain a grading permit and complete remedial work. Weird that it keeps doing that for you. Uh oh. That, that ends the slide? Uh, yeah. That's not. Let me see if I can. We did have a much higher collection rate of contractor costs when we did abatements on sites. Um, approximately $81,000 in contractor costs and we received 53500 of that. So that's a 66% collection rate from violators of their contractor costs when we, the county abated. Did you click on the same thing again? If you clicked on the same thing. Oh, it was hidden in the, oh, clever. That would do it. So additional requirements for site remediation include the removal of hazardous waste and the mitigation of visual blight, such as this. So looking to 2018 and beyond. We're expecting the black market trend to, trend to continue and that there will be holdovers from the regulatory program. County flyovers and GIS remain crucial for a successful cannabis enforcement program. With current staffing and adequate funding, we anticipate we will be able to issue 300 citations for cannabis in 2018. Excuse me. We're also in the process of further refining chapter 806 with these revisions, all code enforcement activity will be paid for by those responsible for violations through case management fees, inspection fees, and appeal fees. A comprehensive fee study is currently being conducted for the building department and code compliance by MGT consultants, they're fabulous. New tools will be implemented for more effective fine collection and both cannabis and non-cannabis appeals will go through the county office of administrative hearings and the single appeal track will allow enforcement officers to be more versatile and efficient and address many more issues in the county. So the cost of enforcement. Through maximizing cost recovery, code enforcement can soon be entirely general fund independent. The fee schedule, however, will not be fully in implemented until July and cost recovery will only come after enforcement activities have begun. Additional funding will be necessary to bridge the gap between operating with an entirely fee-funded program 
to an entirely self-sufficient department. However, we are anticipating a very active and successful cannabis enforcement year. Happy to take any questions. Any board questions? Supervisor Bill? I would say let's wait until we see the full presentation. And then. That is the end of code enforcement's presentation at this time. Would you like to move on to the sheriff? Or? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's move on to the sheriff. Okay. We'll go through the whole presentation and then... Oh. You can move, but don't leave. Maybe I can just ask a really quick question, Mr. Sure. Uh, you and know what? Rick, I'll wait. You I'll have wait a till thumb drive the chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. one is it? That's a good question, Mike. How many? <clears throat> well, those were all burn trees that we uh, made the, out of. Yeah, all bark beetle trees. Okay, this is um, Sheriff's Office presentation. Uh, it's our mission, values, uh, and vision to investigate and eradicate illegal cannabis plants from the county. I'm going to go through this fairly fast. Uh, there's a lot of them that just have actual pictures in them, uh, just showing what we've dealt with. Uh, marijuana enforcement team is tasked with providing daily regulation and enforcement of cannabis within Calaveras County while also investigating cannabis-related crimes which originate in Calaveras County. Um, it's imperative for the health, safety, and the general well-being of the Calaveras County as residents that marijuana team be fully funded for staffing and equipment. Uh, fiscal year 1819 will commence shortly after the implementation of a ban on outdoor and commercial cannabis within Calaveras County. This ban signals an abrupt change from our county's ordinance which allowed commercial cultivation to occur. Without MED in place, enforcement of the ban will be added to the long list of duties for general patrol deputies. It's likely that without a specific and fully funded enforcement unit, cannabis will continue to be grown outdoors in an entirely unregulated and peripheral crimes will occur. These are just some pictures of the size of some of the plants that we've seen. Um, they take quite a bit of time to eradicate. Uh, these are outdoor illegal growths and I know code compliance shows some of those also. Uh, the daily activities for the marijuana team, uh, following up on complaints generated by neighbors of problematic and illegal marijuana sites. To date, there was 1,250 complaints or tips that were received from the public. And I hear quite often, you know, that we're not getting back to people. I have two young ladies that work inside the marijuana program that have to try and return some of these calls along with the marijuana team. And the staffing limits that. And I, I just want the public to know that we're doing the best we can and as fast as we can. but. In this instant, it's kind of like going to the emergency room. The worse off you are, the more attention you're going to get. So when it falls back to that, the grows that are bigger and causing more problems are going to get more attention. Uh, the review, or we're also reviewing uh, permits which are obtained for the cultivation um, and they're abused, some of them. Uh, Large-scale investigations which include cannabis grown in Calaveras County by transnational criminal organizations, and that's speaking to the eradications that we just did down here in the Valley Springs area not long ago and continuing to do. Uh, the inspection of the sites 
as prescribed by the ordinance, along with working with code compliance, we still go out on our own, obviously, and as code compliance does to inspect some of these sites. As you can see in the middle of the screen, you can see the marijuana grows. Uh, there's actually two grows in this particular instance that you can see. These are all in neighborhoods. Um, we see these in flyovers. I know Dennis Mills flies a lot, and I'm sure he's seen quite a few. Um, the arrows point to two grows in the area. Uh, the marijuana members are specially trained in investigating environmental crimes. Uh, they have done some extensive training so that they can be more aware of what environmental crimes are actually occurring. Uh, the damage and the blatant disregard for the environment are common issues associated with the illicit growing of marijuana and without these specially trained investigators, these crimes would continue unfettered. Again, just some of the sites that we've seen. They're digging holes, burying garbage, and who knows what else. Uh, water diversion, making dams out of uh, stream beds. Raw sewage. These are some pretty big grows up on hilltops. Um, and as you can see by the the burned trees around it, we, we know which areas these are in up in the viewed area. The uh, goals and objectives are to continue to mitigate the number of illegal grows in Calaveras County. And historically, the sheriff's cannabis efforts were funded by two budgets split 80-20. At the start of the 80, uh, 18 19 the cannabis budget will be split between regulatory and enforcement with various percentages per FTE. And I want to back up that 2080 was we were, uh, my guys were paid 20% out of the regulatory program that we have, the 3.7 million that was collected in fees, and the other 80% came out of the general fund. Uh, now that's gonna change because we have a ban, so those regulatory fees are untouchable. Uh, I, I'd like to sit down and talk with Ms. Callan and Mr. Lutz about that because the regulatory program is going to continue uh, you have a ban in place, yes, but there's still the regulation of uh, personal grows and caregiver grows that need to be monitored. So I think that that should fall, and that's maybe an offline conversation that we can have about that being paid out of those fees because those are going to continue. And when we start investigating personal caregiver grows, which is supposed to be six plants only, and we come to find that they're growing an entire household, that kind of changes things. Um, the, Keller, or the Sheriff's Office plans to direct uh, charge the cannabis regulatory budget rather than automatically split through the predetermined personal action forms. Uh, the direct charging will provide a higher level of accuracy for the resources needed to operate this unit successfully. The regulatory costs, again, although commercial and outdoor cannabis cultivation will be prohibited by the implementation of this budget cycle, regular costs will continue to occur. The Sheriff's Office will retain the responsibility to maintain files of disqualified applicants. These files will be needed if an applicant moves to another jurisdiction and applies for a state or local permit, which would cause Calaveras disqualifications to come into question, and there's going to be staff time to follow up for that. Total regulatory budget, we're expecting about 193 plus thousand, uh, labor being 180, almost 184,000, supplies and services, just over 10,000. The proposed staffing, you're going to have one lieutenant that oversees everything, 10% on one sergeant, 10%, three deputies. At 15%, I have one current vacancy right now. We were short in patrol, so I had to move one back over to patrol. We have one sheriff services technician at 10% and two Sheriff Services Technician 1s, one at a 20% and one at 30%. The other side of that is the enforcement budget. We're like at just over $1.2 million. Labor is going to be a little over 900000 That's staff, the overtime, the extra hire, and services and supplies at 300000 Proposed staffing, we have our one lieutenant, uh, we have one sergeant, we have three deputies, and we're looking for four more investigators. Um, 
and again, the split will be a 50-50, 50% out of uh, Department 32, which would be my uh, patrol budget, and the other half out of um, whatever, whether you use cannabis funding or uh, general fund. The two sheriff's services technicians and two extra higher sheriff's technicians. Uh, pursuant to state law, persons may legally cultivate up to six cannabis plants in their residence for recreational purposes. And Calaveras County Ordinance specifically requires that these six plant sites register with the county. And criminal enterprises have already adapted to the tactic of hiding a commercial criminal enterprise under the licensing of a personal site. And staff time will be required to determine the registration status of persons who are growing cannabis pursuant to the state law. Again, the Sheriff's Office is requesting to add four investigators to the staff. Each will be funded at 50% of cannabis enforcement budget and the other 50% by patrol. The investigator will be assigned on a problem oriented and community oriented basis. And currently the staffing level in the investigators unit allows for re only allows for reactive investigations. Their assignments may include saturation enforcement in problematic or high crime areas, general crime investigation, specific duties related to cannabis investigation, warrant service, and money laundering investigations. These are the four people that we're talking about, the, the new, new positions. Um, the, invest, the additional investigators will add a protective level of enforcement, or proactive, excuse me. This is just one of the houses that um, we dealt with with the uh, residents that were uh, occupied by uh, transnational organized crime units or persons. Indoor marijuana growing and trafficking by the Chinese nationals. These homes appeared normal on the outside or were altered significantly to accommodate large indoor grows. We served 13 uh, warrants on 13 different homes in Calaveras County, believed to be operated by that organization. Uh, we did work with federal agencies. I brought that to light not too long ago. And nine of the homes were seized by the DOJ. This is a picture of an indoor grow. This is actually a living room in one of the homes. This is another, just another picture of the indoor. The mold, because of the, the moisture content is so high, to keep the plants growing. And these are some of the homes that we eradicated uh, marijuana grows out of. And if you look at these homes, these pictures were taken during the eradication time. So if you look at these homes, they're very nice homes. They're very undetectable from the outside. It took a lot of investigative, investigative work to get enough information to get a search warrant that not only has to be approved by our district attorney's office before it goes to a judge and then the judge still has to review it and decide whether there's enough information. So when you take a home that looks like this from the outside, the appearance is it's a very nice home. You wouldn't expect to find what you find inside. Last year, 2017 stats, total number of locations uh, were 68, almost 60,000 plants almost 15,000 pounds of processed marijuana, just over 35 pounds of concentrated marijuana. We made 57 arrests, issued one citation. We seized 41 firearms and just over $130,000 in cash and one vehicle. These here are registered growers with out-of-state addresses and the green are non-registered growers with out-of-state addresses. And you can see the reaching, um, there's a cursor here. You got Iceland up in Alaska, the Hawaiian Islands, obviously throughout the United States, down into Mexico, and clean over into Europe. And I'm not sure exactly where this one way over on the right is, but it's nowhere near the United States or Calaveras County. Once we catch up to them. Yeah, these were part of the, the eradications that we did on the illegal side. Any board questions? Aye. 
Mr. Chair, I have a couple questions. Sheriff, you've indicated in your presentation that you have one vacancy in your MET team? At this time, yes. All right, and that'll be uh, filled? Soon, I hope. And that'll be filled from someone from patrol or another unit? That'll be someone coming from and patrol. And that'll be backfilled from the people in the academy now? Yes. And the funding has already been budgeted? Yes. Okay, so we don't have a problem for that? No. And you're requesting four more? Yes. So you'll be, once again, either transferring within the department from patrol into those four investigator positions that are 50% criminal investigation and 50% met investigation, is that correct? Yes, these are positions, uh, again, as you well know, Supervisor Oliveira, these are positions that require somebody with some experience. Um, it's not somebody we can pull out of the academy and just put into this program. So these will be experienced officers that we already have working for us. We get these gentlemen, we have people on the training program right now that will be getting off. Actually, we have one comes off here in the next week or so. And as the rest of them progress in their training and they get off the program, we'll be able to backfill that position. And then when the people coming, the four people that I have coming out of the academy in July, they will go to the streets. They're going to have some training on the streets and then we'll be able to start utilizing to bring peop more people into that program. And then you're going to put four more people in the academy for next year. I'm hoping to put a whole lot more than four people. Okay. Along with hiring um, some laterals, which are people that are already officers uh, at other departments that are actually willing to come to work for Calaveras County. But those people going to the academy and the people that are getting out of the academy, uh, graduating from the academy, they're not really effective, are they, for another year? At least a year. And again, once they get out of the academy, they're on the training program, so they're running in, a, they're basically a two-man car for at least three months to okay. get the basic training and then they hit the streets of, as a patrol officer. Okay, thank you. A couple questions before we move on. Yeah, just, are we gonna talk about this page? Yeah, we're gonna move that on. was the Thanks. latter part of the presentation was uh, now to kind of summarize with staffing. Okay. Okay. Right. Sort of yeah. Thank you, uh, Sheriff, and don't run off. Oh no, I plan on staying here okay. till you let me go home, boss. Okay, all right. Sabrina, would you mind loading the presentation back You're up? You're on again? salary, though, right? That's okay. I've heard you here. Thanks, Rick. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, in just kind of a quick summary from the department presentations, and then we'll talk about specific estimates for um, funding for next fiscal year. Um, planning staffing, as um, Peter Maurer noted, that really there's minimal activity going forward. Um, all regular status positions in the planning department are, um, are vacant at this point. We have two extra higher positions. What we are recommending is to continue those for the first two months, um, specifically for any appeals that still come in as a result of um, the, the number that are still being processed with planning right now. Um, we and code talked a bit about hearing um, the hearing office. And I, I will note that certainly any activity done through code enforcement um, will need the process that's been set up and established for that for the hearing office. Um, and we're also looking at, as, as code noted, the revisions to 8.06 that would really keep that hearing office relevant as a, a general matter. Um, cost this year was you know, thus far, 31995 for hearing officer contracts. That's for the actual hearing officers. Then um, we do have two limited term positions, or at least a position and a half. Um, a half FTE admin assistant that's based out of my office um, that costs um, about 35000 per year. And then also the one deputy county council, um, which would be about 90000 300 per year. We feel um, that one, we need those positions as additional support for the program as we um, progress to be effective and the workload um, absolutely justifies the need. 
as we modify 8.06, this will also give us an opportunity to look at general workload outside of, of what cannabis provides to, to make sure that we're adequately staffed and can um, meet any types of um, demands on, on the hearing office. Code enforcement, um, recommend keeping um, the two code enforcement FTEs. Initially at mid-year, we had um, kind of put in an estimator of about an FT and a half in talking to code and, and looking at it, it, it's probably not realistic to try and do one and a half um, as opposed to keeping those additional two positions in there. Um, and those would be, you know, coupled with um, the now senior code enforcement or, or supervisor um, would be the core team for, for cannabis. Now this is where the questions that code's gonna talk more about um, the initial cost of what those officers are and the, eradic the eradication contracts are versus what um, they're requesting, which is two different slides within my, my sheet that are vastly different. So I was hoping for a, a clarification right. from um, building. I'll try to keep this really simple. What the first, the first approach that you saw in the, in the thing, we had four FTEs to get to 228 citations. Uh, as we further found out more information, the uh, supply and service, like the sheriff had 308,000 there, we, we found out that, that was, uh, we needed about $290,000 for services and supplies. So what you saw earlier didn't have the service, services and supplies in there, which also may or may include A87, which we're still investigating. That was a new thing that we just found out Friday and Monday possibly it's two years in arrears in 1910. We, we probably have to probably talk about that, but two years ago, there was a lot of costs that go in there that may or may not be included. So we just kind of estimated that in there. But with that said, the, the new number is more of a performance-based uh, approach to reach, which we call a critical mass to a deterrent uh, effect, which research has shown, or at least we've, we've discussed with other jurisdictions, we had a thousand potential uh, registries grows out there with 30% if it's be about 300 citations. So if we want to approach the gap of performing to the, to getting to deterrent stage, 300 would be the number. So what you're seeing is more the number that we need to reach that, that level of deterrence. Now that's a decision the board would have to make. Either that would be that amount or we can go to the one that's definitely two FTEs, which again is just going to take longer the workload and we may not be able to meet the 300. So that, that's a kind of the decision-making gap that we would have to make on that. So it kind of clarifies in a simple tense of uh, what we're talking about. Excuse Does anything add can, to that? Can, I, can yeah. I step in? I, you lost me there for a second. Wait. So you need the number that we got on the secondary handout, 780. Mm -hmm. This You believe this gets you to the deterrent phase of 300 citation? Correct. Plus the services implies. Plus the service and supplies. Right. So how many enforcement officers? Because I'm having a hard time. If you got 280 with four right. full time, how are you going right. to do it with less? We're, we're going to need more than two. But they'll need at least three to make that happen. We lost a officer just recently resigned, so that's why the presentation showed three. So if we have two, we might we won't make the 300. So. It'd How are you going to make the 300 with three? I you think we could probably tell. I think we kind of calculate. It depends on seasonal. I think, Sabrina, we had some numbers. I and mean, if you can do about 10 per month, um, I think we can reach those numbers. Uh, the new 8.06 would be more efficient, a little more effective. Uh, we've learned how to be a little more efficient. So I think with efficiencies, new tools in place, I think we can be able to do that with three. So, Sabrina, do you want to add some numbers on the inspection? Yeah, we can realistically reach that 300 goal because we have found that a lot of growers are moving indoors. So the typical grow season from May to November is going to be extended. And it will take more work, as the sheriff mentioned. Um, a lot of these places are very nondescript and hard to, hard to locate. Um, one thing about the updated 806 that's very interesting I wanted to point out is the hearing officer would have subpoena powers. So with good cause, a hearing officer could subpoena pg e records, and that will help us obtain inspection warrants and be able to locate these indoor grows a lot, a lot easier. So the 300, um, we're thinking past the typical grow season, and, and it is, it will be a lot of work, but I think it's attainable. Okay, so you guys had 
and last year under the regulation you had six total officers. Is that correct? We had 5.25 total FTEs. We had four basically dedicated. Four board. dedicated, yes. and then four, and you had two other officers, or right part part time. So part -time. it was so equivalent one, to everybody signed about 5.25 FTE. So it went so. from five to. Now we're four. talking only two, so that's a big difference. Yeah. So we're, we're taking into account my promotion yeah, right. and the loss of the officer that resigned. Okay, I just want to make sure that you've got the resources that you need to get out there. What is your cost per eradication or site? That's about $1,660. I mean, that's what we have from uh, actual cost right now, and that includes from citation up to the hearing up to abatement. So <laughs> the abatement cost that we see here would be separate, but that's about $1,600, about set round at $1,700. Is that correct, you guys? That's seventeen hundred. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. That's seventeen hundred. So you take that times three hundred. That comes up to about four hundred ninety thousand plus two hundred ninety thousand in service supplies. That comes up to that new number of seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Now I assume that as you guys move through this process of collecting the fines, and I mean you guys are a, 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 a you're, you're, you have to float on your own bottom most of the time. We are priming the pump. So that right, you guys can and go out and that's. Do this work. We, you realize the first year we're gonna we're, we'll be lucky to get 25 percent. The next year, 50 percent. So it can be spread over five years. Some of the fines and collections, but the eight, new 8.6 dot six gives us more tools to rate, cre, uh, increase our collection rates. So that's why we some lessons learned. I think Ethan can talk a little bit more about the collections part of it. But that's we're trying to fix that also, so we can collect because 16 percent. It's not very good. Now, my main concern yeah. is that you have a. We have a efficient, inexpensive way that seems to work. Right. And you guys have definitely work as, as Ms. Cable put forward, you've worked out a lot of the kinks of this program, uh, yeah. which is great. So I want to make sure that you have enough bodies to reach that critical mass of deterrence. Right. Uh, and, and, and I have to take you guys at your word right. that that is all the bodies that you need. It doesn't feel like it. You guys have a longer season, I guess, now. Well, well, keep in mind that 300 is just the citation. We still haven't even talked about the workload of remedial cleanup. So that's added right. more workload. And you've got to done. do every other piece of code enforcement Correct. in the county. Let's Correct. not forget that. Yeah, yeah we don't want to forget uh, that. So we haven't even wires, got to that area yet. Everything. Right. And that's a big unknown. Mr. Chair. Sure. Thank you. Supervisor Oliveira. Yeah. Mr. Short, I am not going to pick on you, but I'm going to pick on you. Okay. Uh, your code compliance officers, do they react to complaints notified to the code compliance department? They respond to locations, correct? Are you talking about a regular code complaint or just? Hi, code compliance. I got a guy growing pot down here and I want you to come out and take care of him. Yeah, yes, they do. All right. Go out and they do their first. So you thing. send out your code, code compliance. Mm -hmm. He does his initial or she does their initial or they do their initial investigation. Do they interview anybody? Yes, they, yes, they do. Do they yes, interview any witnesses? Uh, they yes, are. they do. Yes. Depending on that information they obtain, mm -hmm. they conduct their investigation even further. Mm -hmm. Let's say that investigation looks into some utility usage or some other sources of information. Mm -hmm. And they use that information to obtain a search warrant. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's correct. And to obtain a search warrant, you have to go to the DA's office, correct? No. no. All right, tell me how that procedure okay, works. The this is a little bit different than a criminal investigation in that okay. the code uh, defines commercial cultivation as a per se nuisance. Okay. So you don't have to prove intent, motive, or anything like that. The very fact that there's cannabis on a particular site is a nuisance by itself. Okay. So, um, so, so if, say, if, if uh, Ms. Cable went down to... Excuse me. Can you get some country music on that? Thank you. So let, let's say uh, they get a complaint and Miss um, Cable goes down to there and there's, there's cannabis present. Pretty much at that point, she issues a citation, notice of violation in order to show cause as to why an abatement order shall not issue. 15 so, days later, an abatement order will issue. And if the person hasn't cleared off their own site, uh, the county will do it for them. Okay. But you don't have a judge signed search warrant. There. Oh yes. The abatement warrants are signed by a judge. Um, but. A search warrant or an abatement warrant is basically a request explaining that there's cannabis on the site, that it is a per se nuisance, and we attach the hearing officer's order for abatement to that. 
Um, then we supply a declaration by the enforcing officer and sometimes a supplemental declaration from a sheriff's officer if there is aerial imagery um, that they took from a helicopter and that is has always been sufficient to get an abatement warrant. Okay. And there is another type of warrant um, called an inspection warrant, which I was speaking about earlier. That is when we do not have the evidence we need. There, there's plenty of, you know, You've almost got it, but you don't see the plants, for example. That's when the pg &E records would come in handy. You have to be denied consent by the occupant or owner of the building, and then you can seek an inspection warrant from the judge, which is just the right to go into the building. And then the citation would issue at that point, and you would still have to go through the process Mr. Turner just mentioned to obtain the abatement warrant. Okay. So, if it's an inspection warrant, you still have to have it signed by a judge? Yes. You go, to the, you, go to the, the you, go, you go to the courthouse yes. with your case packet, you get an appointment with the judge, he sits down, you sit down, you discuss the case, and if he agrees with you, he signs the warrant. That's correct. Okay. And then what's the follow-up investigation? Who serves the warrant? Uh, the code compliance serves it, and the sheriffs act as civil standby for security purposes. The code compliance officer is in charge of that investigation, right? That's correct. Yes, okay. it's our case, it's our investigation. So do you collect evidence? Uh, mostly photographic, <clears throat> but yes. Do you collect any indicia of who owns a residence and things of that sort? Yes, sir. Who books that evidence and where does it go? It goes into our case file. In your case file? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, you have to hang with me here. No problem. Well, I, know I, it's I hate new to territory. be. <laughs> hate to be real. Uh, then what happens after you get your evidence you need to write a citation? You issue that citation to the individual, correct? That's correct. Is that done in person or is it done by mail? Either, but either, both either usually, is both sufficient for service. It's usually posted at the property and served by overnight mail to the property owner and the occupant if we have that information. Then it comes time to come before the hearing officer. Hearing officer, and who presents that case? The code officer. The individual code officer that did the investigation. That's correct. Collected the evidence, yes. sought the warrants, served the warrants. We don't get the warrant it, yet, so we're, we're going to the administrative hearing officer for a hearing okay. to say, here's our evidence. We're saying a nuisance existed on the property at this time. They say, yes, it did, or no, it didn't. They say, yes, it did. We have an abatement order that we then take to the judge in Superior Court for yeah. our abatement warrant. And once again, there's not a fact-intensive inquiry. If there's cannabis on the site, it's a nuisance, okay. um, and it's a misdemeanor or a code violation. So once you get an abatement order, who serves that? We do. As who I is said, we? The investigating code, code officer? Compliance, code compliance. Code compliance. The issuing officer usually with the assistance right. of Who's the Who's in charge of the abatement procedures? Um, the code compliance officer is. And okay. And is there uh, some type of certification that the abatement is successful and that goes into the packet? That's correct. We sir, uh, do a warrant return back to the courts. Same in this state, the warrant Is that served. case closed then? not until any fines or abatement costs are collected. Whose responsibility is that? Again, that falls upon the code compliance, code compliance officer. Yeah, usually the officer, we do have admin staff that can assist with that. And Mr. Turner's also assisting us with fine collection at this time. So how much time does that all take? A lot of time. Give me a minute. Give me an estimate. A week, 25 days? Um, we, we, we have, um, we tracked costs last year and the code enforcement... I'm not talking cost, counsel, I'm talking time. Um, we, we tracked it, 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 average eight hours per case for just code officer time. Just from issue or investigation to the hearing. Mm -hmm. That's not okay. including time spent on site at the actual... Or post-investigation post. -investigation post. The, the things that we do after we go to the hearing, correct? What's that, sir? I'm the sorry. things that, you're, that the code compliance officer does after the hearing, correct? Yes. That's, and that's the abatement and certification mm -hmm. of the abatement mm -hmm. oversees the structure process. Mm -hmm. that, that's true. Everything's got to be documented in a report. You say it only takes eight hours to do all that? Well, that was, those were simply cannabis cases. So uh, they, it would involve uh, Sabrina, who, by the way, she got 11 cases a month last year. She led her team. Um, uh, and um, so it, would, it involves going to the site um, and uh, taking pictures, uh, gathering evidence, putting that into a staff report and submitting it to the clerk of the hearing officer um, and then sitting down for the hearing and uh, proving your case, which is basically if there's cannabis there, then there, there's a nuisance and it should be subject to abatement. I apologize for being harsh on you if I was. Mr. Short, 
That demonstration indicates that you think you can do the job of 300 citations, which is an estimate, with the manpower you're requesting of two officers? Three. Three officers? And you lost two? Is that correct? Correct. Well, we I lost think you're wrong, one. sir. Okay. Well. I, and not to be facetious, okay. I think you're underestimating the need of more and more okay. code compliance officers. Well, definitely more would be make it a lot less if we can't meet that 10 to 12 per month during the I, season. I, yeah. I am going to be very surprised if your program is going to be successful. Right. I, I would agree. With, with your parameters you've said before right. us now. That would be pushing our officers. Okay. Yes. And I made that point to say you need more people. Okay. Okay. Any other Thank questions? You, have, you have another lot you want to continue? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's continue here. So, uh, Thank you the, um, <laughs> the, the end two slides will kind of summarize That's it, and then there will be that discussion piece okay. on, on staffing level and cost. The last piece being Sheriff's Department staffing. As noted, um, the Sheriff's Department is requesting additional staffing for their eradication team. Um, those are four deputy twos that they're requesting, although at 50% time, it's equivalent to two um, FTEs that they are requesting for next fiscal year. And as noted, um, we, and it's, it's important to clarify this um, because we don't want to create new confusion. We are still calling a cannabis enforcement and regulatory um, org keys. It's important to note the regulatory specifically is trying to reflect how much time the sheriff's department will be working on the um, requirements under the personal grows as kind of a, a reflection of where their time is. It's in no relation to the urgency ordinance regulatory program. It's not even the same org key in order to keep um, all of that information completely separate and not commingled. So initially what I had put together again, and that's based on this presentation, was a summary of um, the estimated costs for the cannabis program. Now you'll recall at mid-year, um, the estimate was about 1.5 million. Um, that didn't include the additional sheriff's department staffing that um, we did add into there, which um, bumps that cost up a little bit. It also didn't include, um, including some planning um, time and um, a true up of our actual costs. We had estimated about one and a half FTEs of code enforcement as opposed to the two, two full-time FTEs. That's the difference between where we were at at mid-year and now on my recommendation. Um, now, again, Mr. Short brings up compelling points, which was the version two, the extra handout that you got, where really what we changed is this piece on code enforcement adding um, instead of being the 148,000, um, it takes it up to $780,000 for all of the staffing, um, not including the eradication contracts. I'm, I'm still, you know, even in, in talking through, not clear if it's two FTEs versus three FTEs, clearly, there's a lot more baked into there than the, the position. Um, and my concern is when we're starting to get to a $2.5 million price tag um, going into the next fiscal year, particularly on adding any new positions at this point. Um, it's, it's difficult, obviously, with um, the performance metrics. Is it realistic to hit 300 with the two FTEs? I'm probably not. Um, unless you just give up sleep. Um, but then we'd be paying it in overtime. So um, I, I think that that is an important discussion and lots can depend on what the, what the performance level um, the board would like to see for next fiscal year. Um, Sheriff, do you have any, I mean, there's no doubt that there's a difference between what code does and what the SO's office does as far as putting together criminal complaints, it's, it's the different tasks, although it's all about uh, trying to enforce our law that, that we put through our ordinance. Do you have any idea what it costs per case for the SO's office to process these? 
And I know we're, that's I'm not trying to compare apples and oranges. No, I know I'm just that. looking for the orange. That's, that's difficult because it depends on how big a grow, how much time we invest uh, in man hours to get enough information to get the search warrant. I'd be very hard pressed to try and give you a hard number on what it costs. I can, I can run the numbers and, and probably give you an overall. I mean, you can take the million dollars and divide it by the 50 or however many sites we end up doing, those 60, 69 sites or something. You could divide that and that would give you an average of what it, you know, through all of them. But for each individual site, it's, it's difficult, depending on what's going on on the site. And how much did we spend in personnel costs last year? On Cannabis enforcement. I believe we we're close to nine hundred, almost a million dollars. Yeah, it was nine hundred and ninety-eight dollars. But that included 000. equipment and gear and contractors, right? That's what we spent on it. Because remember, we moved. No, that was that straight was, personnel. That for was our SL? cost. Yeah, that was our. That didn't account for the um, the contractors and a lot of the equipment. Now, let me rephrase that. It it encompassed a lot of the equipment or the the vehicles that we purchased and a lot of the items that we bought to do the program, but it did not cover any of the, um, the contractor's costs. Well, <clears throat> I know that you've got, a, you know, one of my concerns is, you know, we have these Measure C funds this year. Uh, we're, we're not gonna get them again. So I'm trying to figure out, when I think about code enforcement, I think about we're priming a pump that can continue activity on its own bottom in the future. I know you're, you're having, a, you know, we have challenges recruiting deputies and keeping them. So my concern is, you know, I, the MET team is great and they're, they're really effective. My question, my concern is we add bodies on top of that and then we, we don't have money for the MET team next year. We have money this year. So I'm worried, is that gonna be a problem in your personnel ranks? Um, I mean, or you ship them over to patrol and we need bodies there also. Uh, again, that falls back to you gentlemen sitting on the board on what you decide to do next year. If you decide that the marijuana team is going to go away, if I have the positions in patrol, they can move over to patrol. If not, then we're going to be laying deputies I, I, I don't think anybody's thinking, I hope no one's thinking that we're going to shut down the matter or code enforcement in 18, 19. I'm more thinking No, I'm talking about the following. 19, it's 20. Same thing. Yeah. It's, it's the same issue. Um, if, th because the marijuana, the illicit grows are still going to be there. Right. So if the marijuana team is disbanded in 2021, then if the positions are available in patrol, they will go back into patrol. If they're not, we're going to be laying deputies off. Right. Well, I know that we've, both in your department and code, have developed uh, personnel with real expertise that are in great Absolutely. demand. And, you know, you know, I'm sure our neighboring counties would love to get their hands on all of them. So I want to make sure that they stay and we keep our expertise that we've the lessons we've learned through blood, sweat, and tears are ours. I'm with you. So, but I, I also agree with uh, Supervisor Oliveira that for you know this is a cost-effective way to get things done. Sheriff has stuff they have to do. It's not as cost-effective, but you have a very different job. Supervisor yes. Mills, your lights on. Yes, thank you. I'm Maybe this question isn't for you, Sheriff. It's more for the CAO and, and looking in that direction and even for code enforcement is when we look at the cost to run what was done last year, how much of it was taken out of the general fund? Not Measure C, not what was taken out of permits, but what was actually taken out of the general fund? For, for, code, for code, it was zero. It was all regulatory fees, okay. And you expect that for next year in the budget, it would be likewise the same thing? Well, that's where our fee study is. We're going to be coming to the board uh, to talk with the board how we make a different approach. And Tim and I have been talking about wrapping in some of the costs into permits, but that's a risk factor to that. Uh, that's going to be a discussion the board's going to have to. Uh, some of the flat fees that we're looking at, some of the others. So that would be a totally another presentation we'll need to talk about. We're, 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 we're going to be coming soon to the board with that whole study. So that would be getting down into the numbers. And then we're going to show what we need to do over a period of time to get to the success that they're, they're looking for for a full, full cost recovery program. 
and the, and the enterprise idea is, is great, but if we're only getting a 16% recovery now or a 25%, go ahead. Right. Yeah. That's on fines. Yeah. Uh, so when we implement the, the new fee structure, we'll have case management fees right off the bat when a citation is issued, hearing fees, reinspection fees. So a lot of those will be recoverable and the fines will be essentially icing on the cake that can fill in gaps. And oh. when we expect fines to, uh, to increase, Right now, we had 16% as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, Sabrina has filed, is it 11 small claims? 11 case? small claims. 11 small claims cases, and it has collected on a couple of those. Um, we filed uh, three limited civil cases and expect to fa uh, file many more. And uh, some money will, be sh will come out of that. We don't know how much until we've actually done, done the collection. And, and next year, um, we, a case from, from the beginning, from a tip uh, or investigation, <coughs> Uh, we'll go all the way through to collections activity, and, and we're going to be aggressive and vigilant to try and collect as much of that money as we can. And additionally, the fees, if they're not voluntarily paid, uh, become costs of abatement, which become super priority liens or assessment liens on people's properties, and they, are, uh, they appear on uh, an individual's tax bill. Um, and so historically, there's been a very high percentage of, of payment on those assessment liens uh, in the first year. Um, however, in worst case scenarios, you would not collect until five years, and in, and in some scenarios, you would never collect because the property uh, would have no equity at all. And as you know, I'm familiar with uh, Madera County, Fresno County, mm -hmm. City of Clovis, Sacramento, et cetera, and uh, I know we're trying to work on some revisions to 806, but I just want to be sure that we don't create a, uh, a liability here, a long-term liability in our budget by not getting a full and complete recovery. If we know what our recovery rate is now and we're trying to get to, a, like for instance, a 25% recovery rate in the first year, uh, you know, how does that play? I mean, we're gonna have to fund the difference. That's ultimately what it's gonna come down to. Well, um, uh, Ed uh, indicated 25% the first year, 50% the second year, et cetera. Um, I personally would like to think that we would do a lot better than that. Um, the, uh, like I said, the, uh, the fees um, that would be, that would attend all code cases would be cost of abatement, which would appear on assessment rolls. Voluntary uh, or otherwise. Yeah, and that's right. Uh, Sabrina points out that, let's say we start doing a, a, a code case and it ends up in voluntary abatement. The fact that the code officer had to manage the case and see it through to voluntary abatement would also result in an assessment whereas last year we collected nothing on voluntary abatements. Yeah. Um, so we hope to collect um, a much higher percentage than that um, mm -hmm. starting right off. And going back to the fines with the updated 806, new tools will be implemented. I mentioned earlier <coughs> some of those tools are clouding the title and non-issuance of permits on properties owing outstanding fines, unless the permits, of course, are for required remediation work that the code case is based on. But but if we'll have a lot more tools in our tool belt and won't even have to get to the civil suit. But if the point is, is that as Supervisor Oliveira had said, uh, that the amount of staffing that you're asking for versus how, how we're going to be able to get it accomplished it is going to reach a threshold or a crossing point here. I would rather that you, you have the best available tools and manpower uh, at your disposal now because gaining early compliance is going to be much easier than mm -hmm. Gaining it down the road. Agreed. Can, can I break in here for just Certainly. a moment? Supervisor Clapp has asked me several times for a five minute break. Oh. So oh. can we take a five minute break and come back? Certainly. I, I think Thank you. Have some issues or something. Okay. All right, we are back in session. Moving forward. Mr. Mills, you had more comments or questions? Well, I guess what I'm really trying to get to is, is that. Uh, Mr. Fry, can, we're in session right now. Thank you. We only have four members. We're in session, sir. Thank you very much. We Mr. Mills, you are up. Thank you. Um, is, and I agree with Supervisor Oliveira about two code enforcement officers and whether three, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I think five. And to the sheriff, uh, I don't think your Met team's large enough either. And I think that we need to really be serious. If we're gonna go down this road, we need to be serious about it quickly and as, as 
large a group as we can pull together to make this happen. Uh, we can always taper down a little bit later as things work, but uh, if we approach this in a haphazard manner, uh, we're going to have some very disastrous results. And I don't want to see anybody hurt. And that could potentially happen. You've been in those situations. Absolutely. So, uh, I, I would like to be sure that we have sufficient staffing uh, to be able to carry this through. And I know that there's other supervisors that uh, probably have different thoughts or maybe they agree. But uh, we need to have a good, well-written 806. And it doesn't just agree with dealing with cannabis. We've got to be looking at this in the broader, broader spectrum of nuisances as a whole and treat them all the same, because they are that. If we start to relegate out that abandoned vehicle abatement program is somehow separate and distinct and unique, et cetera, we're, we're in, a, in a mess. And, and I think that's helped to create some of the disconnect and discord that's occurred here over this last year. So whatever you do in rewriting 806, let's be sure that we get a broad approach to all forms of nuisances and we treat them all the same way and handle them the same way and abate them the same way. Thank you, Chair. Can I comment on that? That's exactly what 8.06 is. It's creating a, a code enforcement officer has a lot more ability, like a, a beat officer going out there and taking care of a lot of things all at the same time. It's if they see a code case or building permit issue, it, it happens all at the same time. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Thank you. So I'm gonna open it up for public comments at this time. Public comments. One thousand illegal grows. One thousand. Maybe that's right. Maybe that's wrong. We don't know, do we? Some people say there's only five hundred. Some say we know there's a thousand or more. We're going to start looking at PG&E records of private individuals and private residents because we know that with a ban, we forced people to start doing things illegally indoors. How about if I set my grow room up with LEDs and I pile the roof with solar panels? Are you going to be able to tell that I'm using more electricity then? Are you going to be able to tell what's going on in that house? Gentlemen, it looks like you got, what, two and a half million dollars over there? Is that the total cost of that program? And the sheriff is another million? Say he costs us two million and they cost us three or four. 87% compliance with a tax on legal cannabis brought in $13 million last year. It still gives you a healthy chunk left over for well, I don't know, incidentals, uh, going down to 7-Eleven and get a Slurpee or two. Hey, maybe we could fix a road in this county. Maybe we could get a bridge built. Maybe we could get faster internet service up here. Maybe we could lay fiber optic cable. Maybe we could even get a grant. No. Let's try to eradicate three individuals' personal war on legal cannabis. Let's try and get rid of, oh, we'll be happy if we get 300 of those 1,000. My God, what an idiotic thing. Your ban, your ban proposal said 100% compliance. 1,000 illegal grows? Is that 100% compliance? That's the worst possible environmental disaster this county can suffer. And it's due to three of you on this board. One not even here. I have a special I have to go down and politic with the TV station. I have an interview. I, this is not important enough for him to put his time in. And yet he's going to ask to be reelected to that seat. How ridiculous this is. What a, I, sorry. Well, here we are again uh, with a long list of things to do before it was regulations. We had the urgency ordinance. None of that worked. 
Uh, we fooled around with it. The problem got worse. Uh, the more we dinked with it, the worse the problem got. Finally, we got to the point where we can um, hopefully see the end of this problem. I agree with Supervisor Mills that quick is better. As we've seen in the past, as uh, these programs start to unwind after they've been initiated, uh, they become less effective. And in the past two years, I've never seen any requests from the Sheriff's Department or code compliance or anything else turned down by this board. They've been gracious. They've been able to balance their budget. They've been smart with their money. It's there. If you need it, ask for it. When a supervisor says you didn't ask for enough, there, there's a problem there. What I would suggest is what is also missing in this whole process is enthusiasm. We know that people have personal agendas and they bring them to work with them uh, and they have to work around those. We do that in private business, public life and everything else. But I think with a good dose of enthusiasm, we would see us getting more bang for our buck. Not that people are doing it because they have to, but because people are doing it because they want to. They're into their job. They want to make their day as effective as possible so that when they go home, they have that sense of satisfaction. They weren't just getting paid to do it. They wanted to. They were doing something for the people of this county. And one thing, one promise that has been made, and uh, I've brought it up I don't know how many times. It's been about a year since we talked about the environmental registry. As we go through and start eradicating these, pro these uh, uh, grows, we need code compliance, the sheriff, environmental health, public health, whoever, to start providing information to that online system, that database system. People out here in the hinterlands don't have the kind of access that you do. They don't have the kind of access that you do. They want to go out and look for themselves to see where is the danger to them. With the GIS system, with topographic over overlays, they can see who's upstream, who upwind, and uphill. Then they can start taking affirmative action, proactive action, to protect themselves from possibly the chemicals that are out there. If a grow is abated and it's clean, mark it on the map. We know that now. But if there's a problem out there, the people of this county deserve to have access to that information. We were told it was going to happen. And for some reason, staff and the board still have a disconnect. And I'd like to see the board that we elect, your guys are in charge, start running this county. And when you say something, I want to see you follow through with it. Let's get some of that old-fashioned enthusiasm. Thank you. First, I'd like to say thank you for excellent presentation. A um, lot of good information that was presented very well. But I had some questions. I, we hear about these uh, thousand or so illegal grows, and um, did those occur under regulation, under the urgency ordinance, or did those all start after the ban was voted for? Um, we see a whole list of statistics from the sheriff's department of, of problems with marijuana. Did that start after the ban was voted for, or was that under the urgency ordinance? See, we keep being told that regulation is the solution, that we won't have any of these problems if we have regulation. We had regulation. All these problems were under regulation. So I think it's time we give the ban a chance, because regulation didn't work. The problem got worse. And the other thing we're not hearing is how much this has cost. We always hear about this 13 million, but nobody is telling us what it's cost our county in code enforcement, um, all the problems that it's brought that they've had to take care of. We don't really know those costs. Those haven't been given to us. And I'd like to know what that is. What does it cost the county? Did we actually make money off of Measure C or did we lose money because of, of the uh, urgency ordinance? Those are just some questions I have, and, and you know, I look forward to getting some answers to those. Thank you. Susan Morris, Angels Camp. I think I've said this before in the last year, but today I was reminded when I was handed this um, handout. Application statistics issued 210 applications. We had 318 denied and 117 pending. 
all of this time that we have spent, this board, us, hours and hours and hours, and to me it's a zillion dollars if you put it all together with time and energy. That is a lot of money and a lot of time. We want to talk about cost containment, cost benefit analysis. And all I ask the board is, before you, any of us, go down a road, let's know where, where we're going. Let's know what the end is before we start. Because as far as I'm concerned, this whole experiment was a disaster. And we have all suffered. And the hate in this room, just a few minutes ago, one of the people come up here and says, well, you know, we can just continue to do it illegally or we can defy the law. We don't want to defy the law. Our community needs to be morality. We need to have morals. We need to be good to one another. I moved here because of that. And I've met many, many people that are like that. And we've got to get rid of the hate and end this stuff because we have really wasted a lot of precious time and money. Thank you. Any other public comments? Joan Wilson again, hello. Enthusiasm, I love enthusiasm. I think if this county was more enthusiastic about the UO and regulation, then we may have made code compliance's job a little bit easier. $13 million annually. How much is this county going to get now? None? Oh, okay. Well, how much is it going to cost? It's costing about $2 million. And I'll subtract uh, $2 million from $13 million, um, because you guys still have that. How long is that money going to last? What are you going to do after that $13 million is gone? What are you going to give these people to eradicate illegal, non-compliant, unregistered, non-tax pain, illegal black market growers? How are you going to get rid of them then? I want to know. There's a whole county out here that wants to know. Um, we never got to regulations, so there was no experiment. It was not an experiment. It was an urgency ordinance to stop people from coming in and buying up land. And uh, it was to bridge the gap between the state saying, you need to regulate to actual regulation. We're still waiting for that regulation. Remember that EIR? That was supposed to be for regulation, that some people decided we're just going to change the scope of that. We're going to make it something different. We're still waiting for that EIR because the county and the taxpayers of this county are paying for that. We are also going to be footing the bill to get rid of the illegal marijuana grows. Now, I still owe people. So, if you throw me out of this county, fine. You're still going to be paying the bill. Just like you did before 420 and 215. You want to talk about some real problems? How about the black mold? I mean, you're going to be forcing all of your caregiver and all of your um, personal grows indoors, according to your ban. Black mold, mildew. You're going to have some real problems. Everybody's light bill is going to go up. Well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people are because they're going to be using lights to grow. Hats off to you guys. You have put up with all kinds of things. And you were very kind when you came out to my place. Thank you. Most of the Butte fire victims were long-term residents. And uh, I happened to have been in one of the county offices and um, a couple came in and uh, they were being told that they had to have their septic tank um, tested. 
something that it wouldn't have happened except that the Butte fire happened. They had raised seven children there, and now there's only two, this couple. And this, um, this couple was just saying, there's only two of us now. And um, no, they had to do this the county's way. And to me, the county wouldn't have been involved if it hadn't been for the Butte fire. The Butte fire happened, so now that gives the county an excuse to breathe down people's necks and cause them grief, and cause them to leave, and cause them to become homeless. And some people are living right on the borderline, and they're trying to um, live within their means and still be here. And they won't be able to if that kind of thing happens across the board. And it sounds like it will. And that's too bad because a lot of people that are probably trying to make do and live within their means won't be able to. They will, they will be rendered homeless. And I, I think that's a very sad thing. The other thing is, is that on the 4,000 4, people, I mean, not people, but grows that I've heard about, and some people say that's over-exaggerated, and I say it's under-exaggerated. Under a lot of these grows are probably underground. People are not stupid. They have backhoes, and they have all kinds of ways of making sure that they don't get caught. And so they're doing it underground as well. And so I, I just think 300 is a ridiculous amount of pot grows to address in one year. They all need to be addressed. Thank you. Mine's really quick. I think it's a great idea. The harder, the faster, because as soon as we get some eradication going, people are going to want to return, businesses are going to come back, tourism is going to go up, and the light's going to come out at the end of the tunnel. There's not, marijuana isn't the only money that has to come here. There's other sources of revenue. And I think that the new uh, revenue officer that we've got is just a wonderful thing you guys did. I think this presentation was awesome. It gives me hope. I gave my daughter two years. If this doesn't happen, I'm still in my place, and I'm out of here in two years. I really appreciate that you guys are moving forward on a ban. It matters to me greatly. Thanks. Good afternoon, Barbara Uke, District Attorney. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here, and I didn't actually get to watch all of the presentation due to the fiber optics issue with my office that occurred this morning while I was here. I was not responsible for the wire getting cut. I just want to throw that out there. Um, but specifically, I wanted to address the um, additional staffing request that was in the sheriff's office presentation. And I want to remind you that what um, um, impacts the sheriff's office often impacts my office. My office was deeply impacted and has been so because of the urgency ordinance. We did not receive any additional funding. We did not receive any additional staffing. Every time the sheriff's office does a search warrant, my office was helping behind the scenes. Sometimes it can be very quick, 15 minutes, half hour review. Sometimes it takes hours. Sometimes it will take days um, because of um, um, the, the issues and whatever is involved in that particular case. It can be very nuanced and it can take a lot of work and my office will continue to support the sheriff's office of course. Um, however, if um, this new framework is going to be built, I do want to please, please remind you that my office um, is impacted. We will continue to be impacted um, and to try to consider that. I am renewing my budget request for a, a cannabis unit. It's got the same um, cut and paste for the last two years, um, so you'll be seeing that again if any of you remember that. Um, the key piece of the unit, however, is the forensic accountant position. And um, looking at the actual slide, um, am I, this isn't going, am I? Oh, you I can slow that. down. All right. <laughs> um, the money laundering investigation, and on the prior slide, I believe he mentioned asset forfeiture. The forensic account is the key piece to um, building those cases and having that go forward and being more robust. Um, we do have some, I think, five pending asset forfeiture cases right now. Typically, we end up getting the cash on hand. Um, sometimes cars, um, but because of limitations and the lack of ability to do a full um, 
financial investigation, that's all we're getting. We're getting just the cash on hand. We are not looking behind and trying to go for accounts. We're not looking at private property. We are not taking um, private property. We just don't have that ability. They're very intensive cases. Um, it takes intensive, specific um, specialty investigations, prosecution, and um, it's, it's this mixed civil and criminal um, practice that we want to build and that I've been um, trying to push for the last couple of years. So um, in this whole consideration and when you're looking at this big ball of wax, uh, my office is still very much interested in being a full partner in that and uh, I'm trying to take the county back, I guess, if you will, or reshape it, however it's going to go, whatever label you want to put on it. Um, but we cannot do that without additional resources. It's about building that infrastructure that you know, we didn't build a couple of years ago and we're still kind of behind the ball, but at some point it would be nice to start down that road and start building that infrastructure. Um, we do still have our partnership with CDAA. Um, I have a deputy that is based out of Sacramento um, and it's free to the county. They've given us hours and hours and hours of support, um, filing civil cases. Um, out of incidents that have happened in the county, we'd like to do more of that. We'd like to do it um, in a more robust fashion, not just getting the one report or the little slice of the picture that falls on our desk. We would like to do a more um, cohesive and full investigation and really pursue the people who are coming in and abusing our county um, and not just the one violation. We'd like to do the whole scope of the violations and the civil, criminal, and administrative um, um, pursuits that we can, but that takes a team. Um, it takes a cohesive team working together, and um, we need some bodies to do that. And um, Sheriff DeBazillo and I have discussed it many times. I don't care if the forensic accountant is, is housed in his agency. Um, I don't have room for a, a unit. They would be housed physically with him anyway. Um, but it, it really does need to go forward if you are looking at continuing this and trying to take this um, you know, full-fisted approach towards the issue. Thank you. I do have a question for you. Sure. <clears throat> and it has to do with the, because you remember last year I talked about that forensic financial mm -hmm. analyst and the importance of it. Um, is this a time where this board should consider looking at revising our codes regarding how we take money in to avoid money laundering? Is there methodology that we might be able to put into our codes? No, 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 it's a state law. It's, there's already laws about money laundering and there's very specific laws about asset forfeiture when you're, when you're taking someone's personal property, um, you know, primarily money. It's very specific and you have to, um, it's very specific, you have to follow those laws already in place. Well, so they're there, we just need to have the ability to enforce them. Thank you, I refer to the amount of cash that we took in during the urgency ordinance. And, you know, how, how does that relate to money laundering? And if we refused to take cash and we were actually having to go through a bank as part of the payment process, would that help to alleviate the potential that somebody is trying to launder money? Yes. Maybe this is a sidebar discussion for later, okay. uh, but I just wanted to bring it out there that I think that there might be some ways that we could revise our codes and how we receive cash. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's that would be a separate issue. Okay, thank you. So, Barbara, I do have a question about asset forfeiture. Mm -hmm. um, I, I seem to remember um, in the past that when somebody was driving down the road, they got pulled over and they had drugs on them, that, that the sheriff's office or the police department could confiscate that car and, and keep it as compensation. So how, how, how does that differ or is that still, can you do that now? How's that different when going to a house and, and the house is full of pot plants? How does that differ in any way um, when you're talking about forfeit assets? Okay, so there's different ways to take a car, but if you're talking about taking a car for asset forfeiture because the car was used um, in such a way that it satisfies the requirements of the sections, mm -hmm. um, it would be the same type of theory. So if you're, if you're taking it um, because it's a conveyance that's, that's met the minimum amounts of drugs and the right type of drugs, if you can prove that the vehicle was purchased with drug money, illegal money, um, you know, and there's different theories with a vehicle, but if you had one of those theories that you could prove up, um, it takes investigation, it takes a financial investigation, unless of course they admit it, um, then, then we could take the vehicle and then it gets auctioned off 
it's it's not it's not the movies where where the narcs get to use the fancy well, vehicle yeah, for but, undercover, but, but it gets auctioned I, off. And we we have we've auctioned off a couple of vehicles yeah. here at the at the sheriff's office, and we we've taken cars in the past, um, and then the money gets distributed pursuant to the statute. So it would be the same with real property, okay. um, and right. but real property with marijuana is a lot trickier. The feds the feds the federal rules are different from the state rules. So when you're dealing with marijuana, it's, it's a lot tighter on the state side, but it's not that it can't be done. It just needs to be investigated, and it need, we, need the, we would need the resources to do it. So, you know, when we have these houses that were taken for federal forfeiture, um, we have other agencies that are going to be involved in that, and only a certain amount is going to trickle down to the county, compared to if we were able to do it locally, um, more of the money stays local. So under the um, health and safety code, the, the distribution is very, is very strict. Costs come off the top. 24% goes to the state. 65% goes to the law enforcement agencies. 10% um, goes to the DA's office. And 1% goes to CDAA for the asset forfeiture training. Because it's very specific. We're not pirates. You've got to do it strictly by the law. So that would be the breakdown. With the federal forfeitures, it's very different. Um, and you have competing agencies um, who are putting in, and they get reimbursed based on um, their effort and their costs. Thank you. But we can do it. Um, we have done it. We do asset forfeitures every year. And like I said, we've got about, I think, five cases pending right now. Um, the rules are pretty strict, but we, we, we do it. I mean, we would like to do more of it, but it takes, it takes uh, uh, um, more resources. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Public comment? Other public comment? George Fry again. You guys put on a great presentation. You didn't ask for enough money. Always ask for more money than you need. Because they're going to say, oh no, we're going to cut it back some. And then you're going to be in the driver's seat. I support law enforcement 100%. I'm a retired state parole agent. So I'm looking at the. Uh, report that the original report and on page three it says there were 228 citations issued for unregistered cannabis cultivation I have been in this county first came to this county in 1968 August 17th so that's close to 60 years we're probably in our second and maybe in our third generation of illegal growers. They were here when I first came. The next thing I wanted to talk about, I have it marked up here, but I took my fingers off. I didn't have any paper clips. So it looks like, according to, um, the mysterious Clyde Clapp and Gary Tolfinelli at a meeting last Thursday night at the Jenny Lynn Veterans Memorial Hall. You guys are flush. You got tons of money, according to them. They kept saying over and over and over, we're not broke, we're not broke. So I shouldn't see any problem with these people getting the money they need and the sheriff getting the money he needs. You've already made it clear to everybody, Gary, and the mysterious Mr. Clapp. Is he going to get to review the film? What's going on with that? He just comes in, sits down, gets up, leaves, and nobody does anything about it? What kind of representative is he for that district? Not very good. I just don't get it. The only two people on this board right now are Jack Garamendi and Michael Oliveira that know what they're doing. And they return phone calls. The last time you returned a phone call to me, Gary, was last year when the senior of the year. I've called you. You never return calls. I told you at the end of the last election, if you don't return phone calls, you're not going to get reelected. And you don't get it. 
Any other public comments? Aurora Weatherby, District 5. I'm sorry for the tirade that just took place here. It's not a tirade. I was at the meeting. Mr. Fry, you had to I say. put up with that kind of remarks all day today from that gentleman. I never and that enough word. is enough. I was at the meeting. I thought it was very well done. I thought the information was good information and I think it was correct. And I want to thank each and every one of you gentlemen for having a conservative approach to our budget so that we do have a reserve. That reserve is there for a purpose. It's a, I have to budget my money. And if I don't budget my money right, I'm broke at the end of the month. But I do have a little bit in reserve. And I thank you, gentlemen, for seeing that it was done. And again, I apologize for Mr. Fry's tirade. You don't have to apologize for me. Yes. I can take care of myself. Any other public comments? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Any board comments? Yeah, I just got a couple questions, Chair. Um, on the pending remaining have appeal rights, 117. Do we have any idea what the cost is per appeal? How, what, what's it been averaging? I don't, you know, a rough number's fine. It's late. <laughs> we collect $500 on an appeal fee. Um, appeal that goes to the Planning Commission, and I'm just pulling some numbers out of, you know, the air, uh, but um, an estimate would be 10 to 15 hours of staff time minimum to prepare the appeal, and then uh, public noticing costs uh, and uh, the public hearing itself. Um, our cost is probably in the range of $70 to $80 an hour. So, um, okay. Gives you some rough estimate. We're, we're, we're losing money on the appeals, but you know, the par part of the discussion on you know, the appeal fee is. You know, it has to be accessible so the general public can file an appeal. It, it, uh, so there's a, a balancing act there. I appreciate that, Mr. Mauer, because what I'm just trying to do is figure out what that potential cost could be mm -hmm. going forward, knowing those 117 are still there. Right. Um, and we had 65 withdrawn. Were they refunded? No. Okay. Some were? No. Okay. I, there may have been a couple that were withdrawn very early in the process about doing any work, but once we've done the work, um, the money's been spent. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. The, um, environmental clean. Well, this wouldn't be probably for you, <laughs> but uh, the thing that we also need to consider as a board is what would be the potential environmental cleanup costs if we get into a site where uh, we need to get remediation done fairly quickly because of what's there. Uh, we may have to take that from somewhere. We may need to figure out, uh, set aside uh, some pool of money somewhere to ensure that we when we walk away from that property, we leave it where the neighbors are safe. So I just want to be sure that that's included in the discussion as well. Thank you. Any other comments, board comments or questions? If not, I want to thank everybody that did their presentation today. Thank you so much. It was wonderful, good information. And um, Chair, can we get some board direction for the staff out of this? We, sure, absolutely. It was informational, but sure. I'm just thinking that, you know, does the board feel comfortable in, in asking staff to work on a larger um, number of people for next year's budget? And, you well, know, what I, is their comfort level? I think that presentation will come to this based on a lot of the information we got today at, 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 at preliminary budget. I think that's being done now. It's being worked on now for presentation, and that's when our discussions come. And then we have discussion, and when uh, final budget comes, We'll, we'll, we'll know more from where we stand with the state and so forth, but we can have those discussions. But I think m what you're looking at is the presentation right now of these departments and what they're gonna come forward to us at preliminary budget in June, so, and what their needs are uh, for this program. If, if I might, um, you know, this whole thing is very rich in irony. 
if you like that kind of stuff from anywhere. Talking about money that we took from taxpayers who we now made criminals, but we also, and I'd rather spend the money on libraries and roads, but we also have a duty to enforce our laws. That is our duty up here. Whether we like it or not, this is the way it is. Um, I think that, what to, to Supervisor Mill's point, I think it's good to have a little bit of discussion about that, maybe a little bit of pulling, because Tim is putting together the budget right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to have big shifts in June when we're doing this. If we get, and more important, I want to give some security to those key employees that we want to keep around. Um, if we make them wait till June, uh, I, I, we've already lost one of our key players. I'm, I'm sure we've lost deputies as well. I don't want to lose these people. I want to give them some endorsement from up here and some tools for Tim and direction. So I, I agree with Dennis, maybe a little polling would be good. So you, you, you would, uh, Supervisor Oliveira, your, your light is on. You have something to say? I do, believe it or not. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, reinforce the fact that I think code compliance needs to take a look at their manpower requirements and make the necessary adjustments. I agree with Supervisor Mills, Supervisor Garamendi, and Supervisor Tofanelli. Let's come back with a realistic number and get the job done right. Thank you. Is that, is that, is that in two? Maybe in that's the you? polling that we were looking for, direction we were looking for to ensure that we have sufficient staffing to carry out the goals that you're trying to accomplish. I don't want you to feel short, short-handed or that you don't have the, um, the vehicle necessary to get it to the other end. And that I would also like to see uh, some type of report out, maybe in the first 90 days or six months or whatever, to, to just, where are you at? And if you're, uh, you're getting where you want to go, great. If not, then what adjustments are we going to need to make at that point uh, based upon what you see as your goals? Because I want to support your goals. Thank you. We can so. absolutely do that, and we'd, we'd be happy to. Okay. Thank you. Makes sense? Okay. If, if I was going to say, if I could, um, my suggestion would be more or less that is that this is still the beginning part of the budget process. Mm -hmm. um, we are actively meeting this week with departments, next week with departments, and um, this is kind of that, that first step. The, the first goal of this presentation was one to kind of provide the board an overview of where, what we are planning to do for cannabis um, eradication activities next year. Secondly, to um, reassure existing staff as there was some question on those positions that were covered under the urgency ordinance, what was gonna be the disposition. I'm um, at this point to kind of provide some level of, of reassurance that those are factored into our, our budget. Um, the, the harder question is staff additions. And I think it would be hard to make a determination on it today without first looking at all of the other pieces in, in their totality, just because there are a lot of pieces, a lot of different requests that we have to work through. And, and um, to, to that, uh, we have met, we met with the sheriff yesterday and go over you know, his goals and he has a five-year plan and coming up to the preliminary budget. We met with the DA next week um, and, and her what she went or this week, uh, Friday, excuse me, Friday this week, and then we'll go through each department, and then um, we'll have discussions with them and what their goals are. Obviously, they uh, code enforcement has goals today that they want to talk about, and we'll have those discussions, and then we'll bring it back to the board preliminary budget, and we can have that discussion going forward, and we can make the adjustments that we feel necessary to do. But I think it's, it was an integral piece right now of the preliminary budget that we had this presentation. Now, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, you indicated you met with the sheriff's department and all these departments. Who was we? Uh, um, I, we met with the sheriff's office on uh, yesterday, the admin office and myself. Yeah, to be clear, admin office is doing our budget meetings throughout the, the last, this week and next week. Um, I had reached out to the chair and asked if he could um, attend a couple of meetings that were on um, some of the personnel discussions because I thought it was an important discussion. Um, that, again, it's gonna come back to the board. Yeah. I was unaware of any meetings. Was, were you advised of the meetings, Vice Chair? Okay, thank you. 
All right, thank you so much. We'll take a couple minute break. Madam Clerk, next item, item number 23. Item 23 is from the Board of Supervisors. The appointment of applicants to serve on various committees, commissions, advisory boards, and county service areas. <clears throat> so we have, um, we have several appointments That's for nice today. Um, I'm gonna kind of take them out of order uh, because one needs um, a little bit of information to be provided to you. The first one is a vacancy on the CSA 4 Diamond 20 Road Advisory Committee for one vacancy for a term ending 12-31-2020. And we have an application from George L. Stevens, Jr. The other is a, a vacancy on the Valcito Cemetery District Board, one vacancy for a term ending 12-31-2019 and an application has been received from B.K. Hollers. Now, for the Law Library Board of Trustees, um, as part of the annual review that the board authorized me to do this year, um, we determined, in working with County Council, we determined that the membership criteria did not correctly reflect the Business and Professions Code. The appointment of these applicants will make that correction. So the first is one vacancy for a term ending 12-31-2018 for an attorney. We have an application from Sarah Decay. We have one vacancy for a term ending 12-31-2018 for an attorney. We have an application from Kenneth Arola. And then Ms. Pestalozzi was appointed at the last board meeting um, as a member of the general public. Um, what we had determined was that with the attorneys that had filled the vacancies um, the way that they had, that Ms. Pestalozzi um, could be appointed as the Board of Supervisors designee at the discretion of the chair at his recommendation. And so um, Chair Toffinelli has um, agreed that Ann Pestalozzi can um, act as the uh, board designee on the law library. Further review of the law library board of trustees, uh, we discussed um, when they have their meetings. Um, apparently they've been meeting every other month. They will be, um, they're supposed to meet every month. So um, that will be um, coming into play soon. Um, the other thing that's being looked at right now by county council's office is whether or not form 700s need to be filed. Um, if they need to adopt bylaws and if they are actually required to follow the Brown Act. So those things are still in process as part of our review. These appointments will allow the group to um, have a quorum for their meetings. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to um, we have answer. One more. Alicito. I read that one Did before. You read that one? Okay. Yeah. All right. So I guess what we have is, is anybody object to any of these? No, Mr. Chair. I have a question maybe for clarification. Uh, prior to this year, I was board chair, and it was my understanding that the board chair was a sitting member of that board. Uh, is there something that I it need is to be the, aware of? It no, is the I, board I have chair, no objection. It is the board chair or his or her designee. A designator or a designee. Okay. I just want to make sure that we really. I would be the designator. She would be the designee. Yes. Yeah, you're a terminator. <laughs> do, you have a motion? Uh, do I have a motion? I move. Sorry. Do we got a motion? Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Uh, any public comments on this item? Seeing none, bring it back to the board. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 401. Madam Clerk, on to the last item. Supervisor announcements. In compliance with AB 1234, chapter does government code section 53232.3D, board members shall provide brief reports on meetings they attended at the expense of the local agency at the next regular meeting of the legislative body. This report is required to include 
meetings attended for which there has been expense reimbursement, such as mileage, meals, lodging, etc., but may also at the board member's discretion include any other meeting attended by the supervisor on behalf of the county. Let's start with um, Supervisor Mills. Yes, just one uh, meeting, and I know that Supervisor Garamendi was there as well as a camera, and I, I appreciate you being there because uh, you saw how much we are engaged in the politics of water and legislative. It's very um, cons disconcerting that the state would go forward with a water tax. And uh, I think that there's been some opposition from Aqua and the other water agencies about that. Uh, AB 142, it looks like there's a good consensus for it. And the five uh, uh, elements that have been added to it, whether that will actually occur, or whether this will end up on a budget trailer bill as, as a gut and amend, we don't know. Uh, but it's still up in the air about the wild and scenic and whether or not the uh, water agencies will be able to have standing. Um, other than that, uh, I think it was just a very productive discussion amongst the various members. Thank you. Supervisor Oliveira. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I attended on the 19th, which is Thursday, with Mr. Short, a tour of the Arnold area to discuss code compliance uh, violations and the general condition of the highway for uh, frontage areas and locations. Uh, we did take a look at several of the good uh, points about code compliance and of course some possible violations which we'll be following up with. I want to commend Mr. Short on his ability to bring the code compliance department into an effective uh, part of the county. Uh, I also attended uh, on Monday, the Central Sierra Child Support uh, Agency, which I am the sitting member representing Calaveras County along with Supervisor Tofanelli. I attended with, he also attended there. And I must admit that that group is doing a fine job. Uh, they, I understand, as I'm sure Supervisor Tofanelli will back us up on this, that they're probably in the top 10% in the state as far as doing what they do. So good job and kudos to those folks. <clears throat> I did attend Earth Day in Angels Camp on Sunday uh, for a brief, a brief, short time. Uh, it was kind of, kind of exciting. We kind of went back to maybe the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and folks were very entertaining. So, with that, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Garamendi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I will try to be brief because I have to get on the road, as you all know. Um, it was a really good meeting at camera. I do think we need to think about my membership on camera. Not that I don't think it's super important, which it was, it was a great crew. It's just I always have a conflict with RCRC. This is the only meeting I've been able to attend. I know we brought this up earlier. I know Supervisor Mills does a great job on the committee. There's two slots. so. If there is somebody else who wants to fill that in, because I don't know if I'm going to get to the next meeting either, because they just keep coming on the same date. We, we have an alternate designated for that. Yes, we do. Who's our alternate? And we can talk about it later if you want to. Add. Yeah, we can talk. Why about don't we talk about it later? And I promise I will notify the alternate. And see if we could change it out. Yeah, that, okay, Mr. Chair, I will complete. Yeah. Okay. Well, I went to a lot of meetings. I, I went to. Let's see. Um, Thanks, Gary. <laughs> Actually, for the record, to, uh, I'm driving to Humboldt for an RCRC meeting tonight, so I'm looking right now at about a 12.30, 1 a.m. arrival. And you're not going to fly? Yeah, I, I had an airplane. The, the child protection, the Central Sierra Child Protection Service Agency, uh, and Supervisor Oliver was there. They are an outstanding group of people there, and that's all I have to report. CAO, anything? Nothing. Megan, nothing. Board Clerk, Diane. Okay, um, I'm looking for your entry forms for the frog jump, which is at our next meeting, May 8th. So the deadline for registration is next Friday. Um, so please get me your registration forms and your money. Thank you. And with that, we stand adjourned. No, we don't. Wait. Oh, we have to continue public comment. I'm sorry. Is there any further public comment that didn't make it to the podium earlier? Seeing none. We now stand adjourned. Thank you, Madam Clerk.